My friends, welcome to the Five Forts and Beyond live stream. Yes, it is. Uh, I have. I'm not by myself. I've got my friend Gray Waste Tim. Say hello, Gray Waste Tim. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to be talking Five Forts and all the Lovecrafting stuff. Uh, I usually try to wear something appropriate to these streams. So today we got representing Miskatonic University. Go fight in Cthulhu. Very good. Well, I'm representing my 49ers who are winning right now. Working, working Dallas over a little bit. Shouldn't shouldn't talk any smack till the game's over. But you know, go Niners. Representing for the Bay Area. So, yeah, here's how we're gonna do this. Uh, Gray Waste Tim, you will be our Sherpa. You will be our guide to the Gray Waste. Since you're Gray Waste Tim, you know all about the Gray Waste. So, I am going to play the part of the person on the tour who is a little bit smart and like smart enough to like know the right questions to ask you know like mm -hmm. so i've heard about the great empire of the dawn you know that's kind of my thing i know a little more about a shy but I've, i'm not as not as schooled up on these other places so we'll all be going on the tour with you uh gray waste tim you're going to guide us through some of these places and um I'll pipe up a little more on the five forts. I mean, uh, the, you know, the Great Empire, of the Dawn stuff, and then I'll ask I'll ask some pointed questions, and I'm sure our chat will help out too with questions for you regarding the oddities and wonders of the further, further east. Of course, uh, last week or last Wednesday on our live stream, we did Karth, uh, Magic of the East. We talked about Karth and based Dothrak. So today, we will be going further. And I'd like to start off by saying thank you to Mr. Michael James, who four month squisher. He's got the sexy squisher icon. He says, are the five forts interconnected by a massive wall as the artwork suggests, or are they situated to block mountain passes? So it's not said, of course, uh, but I do tend to think that the art that we used for the cover, which is by Enrique Merguia, is probably right on the money. I'm guessing there was at least some kind of wall between the various forts. It's just that the forts are so big, they're the thing that everyone talks about. It's like, yeah, there's some sort of wall, but the wall's not, you know, gargantuan. It's not like the wall of Westeros, or else they would talk about that. So it's probably just an average defensive fortification, you know, kind of low wall or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got these godlike five forts, and those are kind of what everyone talks about. What do you think, Tim? Yeah, I think between the five five individual forts, you have sort of a buffer wall that links between them and form, forms just like a uh, a nonstop wall between them. We can kind of picture the wall in Westeros, how it does have 19 castles on them. I mean, only three are operational at the moment, but they are there. So just kind of think like the wall, but just built, it's instead of built out of ice, it's just built out of this fused black stone. And it says that the, like the uh, the forts themselves, if I can see in my notes here, I actually have the forts. Yes, I hope you have so, your notes, Tim. You have pages and pages of notes. We'll be in bad shape if you don't have those. Yeah, the few so the five forts are they're made of fused black stone and they're almost a thousand feet high. I d I wouldn't say that the walls that the uh, walls that intersect between them are necessarily that high, but they're probably high at probably at least a few hundred feet, just to just to prevent any any sort of scaling over from them. Yeah, I mean the only way it would make sense to not have walls connecting the forts is if. Um that was part of the strategy. Like perhaps they're a cavalry force and they, they, you know, they let people, you go anywhere near the forts and then like, they don't need a wall because they can just let you sort of fill the valleys outside the castle and then storm out. Or maybe they can rain down fire from any position, but it does make sense. Like there would probably be a low stone wall. So I think Enrique Maguia is, uh, is correct in, drawing it in there oh cleo are we really gonna tantrum only five minutes into the stream <laughs> does that seem like a good idea girl and apologies guys uh for the false start today we started with one with the newer ecamm software but of course i'm having computer issues i'm awaiting the computer upgrade and uh i'm having it's complicated to explain but essentially with the ecamm software which works in 1080 it was not working with a guest 
I had not had a guest on with that today. Um, it will when I get the new computer, but that's why I had to close that stream down and jump over to StreamYard here and make a new stream. So thanks everyone for being patient and migrating over. If you're watching after the fact, you don't care. So we will move right along and talk about all this content. But yeah, guys, just quick update on the computer. I'm almost there. I'm still a little bit short of the goal. I'm probably going to have to wait till my next paycheck to get over the top. But you guys have got me most of the way there. So I really appreciate that. And I will have this situation under control within a week or two because of that. Um, if you'd still like to send in a donation and put me over the top um, and help me uh, get this computer without beg borrowing and stealing, uh, then uh, paypal.me mythical astronomy. I don't want to keep begging for money or anything, but some people have been asking, how's it going? Are you there yet? So I'm almost there. I will be getting a new one and uh, I could use a little more if you've got it. Uh, but thank you everyone for sending in donations. So that being said, Tim, let's uh, let's get started here with our Sherpa Ing. And uh, where, are we, where are we going first, buddy? Well, when we first go past the bones, there are three, while there are numerous foothills and different ways to get over the bones, there's only really three surefire ways, quote, like more safe ways to get through, which are the three main roads of the sand road, the stone road, and the steel road. And then those roads each lead to the sister cities of Kaya, 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 Kaya Naya, Kaya, Kaya Naya, Naya, and Bayasabad. That's how I say them, but yeah. Yeah, these are some of the more complicated uh, names that George has come up for places, but they're the they're the sister cities. They're the remnants of the patrim patrimony of Harkoon, and they are ruled over by the great fathers and protected by uh, warrior women. Uh, they believe that those who give birth, only those who give birth, are permitted to take life at will. Which, of course, if you guys uh, remember from the Vedic Indian origins of Danny and Drogon, that's a very Kali like concept uh that these these women both give birth and give death and it is because they do one they can do the other so it's very much a uh a death goddess turning the cycle of life and death kind of a thing very cool and in the case of uh kaya kaya naya that one is built uh from walls of black basalt black iron and yellow bone so when we get the idea of the black basalt i think it's supposed to be reminiscent of Mok Kalen and also to be uh, more and also reminiscent of as we go further east, more of this fused black stone that we're going to come across and then into a shy where we start to see the entire city made out of the infamous oily black stone. It's real quick. I want to shout out my mod, Blaro Blarsnark, who is proposing um, a reverse OnlyFans where people have to pay him to put his clothes back on. To raise money for my computer carl that's too kind man too kind um <laughs> appreciate the gesture uh so one of the interesting thing about these three cities is that they were uh mentioned in a game of thrones they're not mentioned as being in the bones mountains it just says warrior women from those three cities that have you know iron rings in their nipples and rubies in their noses i think is, is the combination or maybe you got that backwards that, it, in any ways. Um, <laughs> it's uh, rubies in their cheeks. Rubies in their cheeks. Okay. So um, this was an idea that George had very early on that he sort of backfilled. Um, so they guard these three mountain passes. And I got to say, uh, Sherpa Tim, as we go over the bones to the east, I'm a little unnerved by all these bones uh, that we're seeing in the passes here. Um, as the maesters have said, there's bones of people as well as animals. And it looks like a whole migration happened here. But the thing is, they were going west and we're going east. So what were these people running from and what are we running into, Grey Waste, Tim? Well, they're running from the long night and whatever happened to bring on the downfall of the great empire of the dawn. And it said that every in the long in, in the before times in the long, long ago the before times. <laughs> yes. Uh, everything between the Bow Mountains up to the Grey Waste was a part of this great empire. But, and it was ruled over by the God on Earth, who is the only son of the Lion of Night and the Maiden Maid of Light. Well, and he seems he, like a pretty nice fellow. That sounds sounds grand. And he ruled, if, we're, if the legends are to be believed, he ruled for 10,000 years. 
and then his son, the Pearl Emperor, ruled for a thousand years, and so on and so on. We have the Jade Emperor, the Tourmaline Emperor, the Onyx Emperor, so forth, so forth. But each emperor's reign was shorter and more troubled than the last until finally we get to the Amethyst Empress, whose reign was usurped by her younger brother, the Bloodstone Emperor. Hey, Damon. And he is blamed for bringing on the Long Night. Now, yeah, and, and of course, the key detail in that story is where it says, you know, even after he was defeated and the Long Night was ended, the Great Empire of the Dawn did not reform and the tribes of men scattered their own way. And that's kind of where we're the entry point to what we're doing here. You know, the Great Empire of the Dawn was this big grand thing, but it, it was just it's Atlantis, essentially. It was destroyed 8,000 years ago or whatever. It did not reform. And in its wake sprung up all these kingdoms. And so you've just you've already mentioned the three cities in the in the bones by Asabad, Samiriana and Kaya Kayanaya. And they, of course, are remnants of one of the kingdoms that seems to have sprung up in the wake of the Great Empire of the Dawn. And they maybe have even had an identity within the Great Empire of the Dawn simply because that name, Hercoon, right? The patrimony yes. of Hercoon, it's gone now and all that's left are those three cities. But that name, Hercoon, that's given as one of the names for Azor High. And of course, that's from Eldrick. So... Take it away there, and let's talk about the patrimony of Harkoon. All right, so with the patrimony of Harkoon, it used to be a lush, vibrant kingdom until what is known as the dry times, where all of the land, the fertile lakes started to dry up. What we're left with are these just dry riverbeds and that stand atop these canyons. Uh, but the three sister cities remain, again, guarding the main roads, uh, I would assume if we were to look at this and from like a real world perspective, probably what's keeping these cities alive would be a form of tax that's going on these roads, ensuring safe travels uh, over over the bones, both east and west. Because, of course, this once you get over the bones and continue going east, that's how you're going to get to E.T. Yes, and they're, they're lords of the crossing, right? It's just the fray routine. They're playing they're playing toll man. Yeah. The protection yeah. racket. It really, it really is. It's a, uh, it's the organized uh, Sherpa mobs, really, if, if we could think of it like that. But what's interesting about that, and one thing that I want to note was when we think of this idea of the warrior women, that only those who are allowed to give life are allowed to take life. This is kind of an inversion, like or a perversion of the others, or the others are perversion of that because the others. Uh, are granting their own form of unlife. And the patrimony of Harkoon is ruled over by the Great Fathers. Now, back if we look back to our Crypts of Winterfell stream, we had talked about the Great Mother and how close that is to the Great Other. The same case for the Great Fathers. And in the case of the Great Fathers, it says that most of the boys that are born, the majority of them are gelded. And only the strongest and most handsome are allowed to continue on and breed and become great fathers in their own right. Yes, so hashtag, hashtag, this is the future liberals want. <laughs> <laughs> Feminism which, gone crazy. <laughs> but in, in the idea of that, it makes me think of like all the, uh, the sacrifices that are, and I think this is what George is trying to invoke, is when he makes his... Because we're never really going to see these things in our main story proper, uh, what George is doing is he's taking these things, but he's also play, making he's phrasing them in a way that it, it tries to get you to think about something that is going into the main story. If for me, with the boys in the Patrimony of Harku, it makes me think of the sons of Craster, the sacrifices that are being made. Well, how and because we're still unclear as to how exactly the others are made. And so it's not a guarantee that every son of Craster is being made into an other because as we, as it's been discussed like multiple times, all magic is rooted in blood magic. So how many of these children are actually turning into others and how many are being used as sacrifices to create those others? It's probably more of a, like not every child of Craster is, is, is going to become an other for yeah, the most part. Most That's of them are probably being used as ingredients for one special one to become another. Yeah, I, I've definitely shifted my thinking about that. Um, sorry to jump in earlier there. Yeah, it's, I used to think that it, 
just more straightforward, like what we saw on the show and what's implied. Oh, they're all his brothers. So all the babies are turned into White Walkers. But the more I think about it, the more it makes sense that these babies are being used to maintain the spells of the White Walkers that hold them together, maintain their existence. Um, and that makes sense of uh, why Craster offers sheep when he doesn't have any sons, because a sheep, while less valuable magically than a human is still a blood offering um, that perhaps can be used to maintain the other's existence. And it, it may sound silly. Why give the other sheep? Well, the others don't, they can't really, they don't have sheep. Like <laughs> they, they live in the heart, the lands of always winter, you know? So, um, mm -hmm. and I, I think so. I think that does make sense of it. And yeah, like you said, it's all the magic in this world basically comes down to blood magic, it seems, or at least the most powerful kinds of magic. So, uh, yeah, it does remind me of that. It also reminds me a little bit um, of like the Green Seers. You know, a brand loses his fertility, um, and really, you don't have kids once you wed the tree, you know. So, it's mm -hmm. kind of like they're being. Um, well, sorry, the comparison's a little, it would require to go through corridors of symbolism and stuff, so I don't want to even do that, but <laughs> it is, yeah, it is interesting, um, and it's almost a flip of, like, Night's Queen, where, you know, with the others, there's only one female that we've ever heard about, and she's implied as having fathered the others, uh, shout out to my origin of the others, Night's Queen video, whereas here, we have one father and many, many women, um, so it's kind of a flip, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you, I feel like you are getting at the heart of of why of why I was so gung ho on doing a stream like this because even though these far eastern places, even though we may only get like a just a sentence or two in the back pages of the Song of Ice and Fire, what George does is the way just just that little bit of information he gives. Oh, if you take that and then apply it to other aspects of the story, look for the foils, and then also in as we go further east and take more, we get to the more, even more Lovecraftian of them. If you take those references and put them back to their original stories, you can get like a whole world of what's actually of what he's trying to do here. So even, even just a sentence, while that might be the only information we're given about a place like Patrimony of Harkum or Kadath or something like that, you can still, there's still so much you can build upon that just to get an idea of what, of what it is, of what exactly might be going on out there, even though we'll never see it. Yeah. Um, George uses a lot of parallelism, um, both with symbolism as well as like themes, uh, both. And those are usually tied together. And I've often pointed out that this is something that's crucial. If you're going to write a book that has so many POV characters and so many different plot threads in order to make it cohesive, you have to do things like, use the same themes in multiple stories, put similar characters in similar positions and see how they react differently. You've got to have things that tie the different threads together. So even the obscure little bits of world building do tend to echo the themes, like we're talking about with fertility and reproduction, as well as the symbolism. So we've got these, uh, yes, the, the you know, are... back, back in the days uh, when I was doing my podcast and, I went a little further with my tin foil and my speculation, Tim. And uh, let me, let me, this is a good day to, to wheel this out. Let me pull up the map. We have to look at the map for me to explain this. This is a map, a map based tin foil theory. Uh, so just to get your juices flowing here, everyone. Well, while we get that green. Going. Like theme, we just got themes are important. They're not just for eighth grade book reports, no matter what D and D want to say. That's right. They're not. That's right, Tim. They are not. They are. They're for stories. Book reports are about books. Books have stories. Stories have themes. So book reports have themes, um, and that's a good thing. So check this out. This range of mountains looks a little bit like a sword. Okay. It's a vertical, it's a long vertical shape. And I can even see the island of Greater Morak as the handle. Greater Morak has Pharos, the light, uh, the, you know, the home of the stone cow. But of course, Pharos is a shout out to the lighthouse of Egypt. So the idea of this is, this could be a light bringer sword, but it's also giving you the idea of ice. Okay. So look at the mountain range. 
if you look up north, it's frozen up top. Those mountains are white and icy. Uh, and what is uh, Kaya Kayanaya? What's the description of that? Uh, or I'm sorry, forget the castle. It's the roads. So the steel road, the stone road, road. and the sand road. And the sand road. Okay, now I think that these, I used to wonder about the, the ingredients for Valerian steel or Lightbringer. And I was coming up with three ingredients, basically steel uh, is, you know, self-explanatory iron. The stone is the meteorite and the sand represents the glass or the dragon glass, because that's one theory about Valerian steel or light bringers that dragon glass is involved, either mixed into the Valerian steel or maybe light bringers, literally like a giant glass candle that you swing at people. Right. So you've got these three ingredients. Now on the bottom, it is. Uh, it is hot, and the sand road runs by Karth. Um, and then as you get up to the middle, you've got the stone road. And then, like I said, the steel road up top is frozen. It's in the, the, it's in the white bones. bones. The white bones, exactly. So There's the, the white bones in the north and the dry bones in the south. Right. So I don't know. I, like I said, I was looking at all this, and I was like, huh, it's weird that it's it's vertical just like a sword. And then I used to be looking for that pattern of uh, basically glass, steel, and stone. And you find it a few different places, um, but it's just like, it's so obscure. It's hard to tell if it's, you know, seeing faces in the clouds or there's actually, you know, deep sort of symbolism and stuff going on there. But it, I did find it interesting that you've got all these elements here in the mountains. Um, like I said, you know, sand for the dragon glass, stone for the meteors, steel for the for the iron and then down at the handle because of course sorcery is you know a sword without a hilt you got to have some way to grasp it and then down there we've got pharos which represents a lighthouse so they could be talking about lightbringer and then you look at the warrior women they have the black iron rings and the rubies so you got your black and red targaryen symbolism you know rubies are associated with rhaegar fire with blood um and then, of course, the iron is iron. So, and then there's also the components that make up the three castles. I forget. You started talking about what they're made out of. One was black basalt, which mm -hmm. might be oily black stone because of the Mo Kalen evidence. And then steel and bone. It's a um, black iron and yellow bone. Yellow bone, right. So, uh, yeah. And yeah, as we go total like, tinfoil, guys, don't don't quote me on any of that crap. I just <laughs> no, no, it's it's good. I never uh, actually now that because I never made that connection with Great Morak as a handle, but I did always have the feeling. Uh, I'm with you on Dragon Glass. I always believe that in when making Valyrian steel, that Dragon Glass was involved, either infused in the seal somewhere in the smelting process. Dragon Glass, I see as being a, a component in, or like an ingredient into Valyrian steel. So having that relate to the sand road, yeah, because burn, you know, because that's how you make that's how you make glass. Burning burning sand, you can can result in glass. So it, it actually does make sense on its in right. And then these three cities, they're the remnants of Hirkun, which is Hirkun the hero, which is a different name for Azor High, who carries Lightbringer. So again, it's 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 pretty like I don't know if George is doing stuff that's quite that nerdy as to like spell out the ingredients of a sword uh through symbolism and stuff but he's done some pretty crafty stuff and so like you know why not i mean it's not impossible i don't know so anyways let's uh sure let me give control back to you mr sherpa and uh let's see did you have some more that you want to talk about or like why don't you give us the composition of the other two castles since we've started talking about that the one uh, you described already was Kaya Kaya Naya in the north, right? Yes. And then uh, so Samiria, so that's the one that's made out of Greystone. And then Biasabad, uh believe that one, because I didn't really I didn't really put that one in the notes because the, the other two aren't as noteworthy as Kaya Kaya Naya. Uh, but Bayasabad, I believe, is made from the red is made from the red sandy stone that's uh, also incorporated in the Karth. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that would make sense. Um, let's uh, let's look it up here. It's 
fucking web page. <laughs> no matter how I try to scroll, it just keeps jumping up or down. It's like loading ads. And, ugh. Do we need web 3.0, guys? Is that what we need? I've started hearing about this. Um, okay, so let's see here. Oh, it doesn't say. It doesn't have, at least in the in the wiki, it doesn't have the description of it. it just as it guards the... Uh, That one pass. Yeah, that's it. like I said, of the of the three, Kai Kai and Naya is the is the most noteworthy one because of this whole black basalt thing. Mm. Also, because uh, Kai Kai and Naya, uh, which guards the Steel Road, the Steel Road gets its name because of the numerous battles that have taken place there, and Kai Kai and Naya is still technically at war with the Jogos Naya. Like it is a centuries long <laughs> war that kind of like it had it, it like. At some point, it goes cold, and all of a sudden, it goes hot again. When the Jogo Snaya lead a raid, and then Kai Kai and Naya responds, and it's just like it's just like a, ne a never-ending thing as the Jogo Snaya lead raids into Kai Kai and Naya. But the Jogo Snaya, for their part, they're also leading raids into Yt. And when we get to Nagai, Nagai's been reduced down to uh, the one city in Nefer, and that is also because of the Jogo Snaya. So the Jogo Snaya are just lashing out at every single neighbor around them they're bloodthirsty bastards dude that's it's like everybody hates the chogos nigh and the jogos nigh hates everybody else that's essentially how it works um in the origins of the dothraki stream i compared the dothraki and the jogos nigh as you know uh horse people or zorse people on two sides of the mountains of course the dothraki have a cultural memory of crossing over the mountains so they come from the jogos nigh side of things and you can imagine what happened like they crossed the mountains and found horses there were only sources on the one side and that's what the jogos nigh ride and so over thousands of years you know natural selection has made them shorter so they can ride the sources whereas the dothraki they're much taller and one wonders if they probably uh interbred with the ancestors of the sarnori because the sarnori are very tall uh, they are called the tall men they have the same skin color, the golden brown skin that the, the Dothraki have. They also have black hair like the Dothraki. Um, so I have noticed. And then, of course, the uh, the Sarnoi are also very skilled horsemen. They just use chariots because they are farmers. They are city dwellers. So we've got the pastoralist horse riders in the Dothraki living on the steps of the mountains. And I'll scroll up so you can see this. Um, they're they're. Vase Dothrak is, is right next to the Steel Road in Kaya Kayanaya. And then all of these ruined cities of the Sarnori are right here. So you can you can see the evolutionary trail. The ancestors of the Dothraki, who used to be more similar to the Jogos Nai, come over the mountains. They start interbreeding with the taller predecessors of the Sarnori. And over time, the Sarnori and the Dothraki you know, become or maintain separate cultural identities because one of them is a group of city dwellers and the other a pastoralist. It wasn't until the Doom of Valyria that the Dothraki rode down out of the steppe land, and you can see the mother of mountains from there to the bones. That's the steppe land right up here, the very, very easternmost part of the Dothraki Sea. And it wasn't until after the Doom that they rode out across the entire Dothraki Sea destroyed Sarnor and took over everything all the way to Kohor. And this is George borrowing from real history, of course, and you can get in on this if you want, Tim. You know, the Mongols essentially were a small local, you know, group, several similar bands. And then once Genghis Khan rose to power, united the clans, blah, blah, blah. Then they sweep across all of Europe into, you know, far into Europe, basically as far as the steppe land goes. They only stopped when they reached natural barriers that they didn't feel like crossing um, because they could cross them if they wanted to, but they would stop uh, at times because once you're pat, once you're out of the steppe land, then the, you know, the Mongols can't quickly support one another. That was the whole thing with horses. You can go back and forth across that step pretty quick comparative uh, compared to armies marching. Yeah. So similar oh, yeah. thing with the Dothraki here. Go ahead. I was going to say, I have, uh, a lot actually on the Mongols, and I actually think it relates to before we lose it. This this super chat, it act, I actually like this super chat because it's going to bring up something that I was going to go into. Uh, Marla Matthews asks, 
what is up with the Great Sand Sea? It looks like someone dug a hole and made the Bone Mountains. Now, like earlier when we were talking about the patrimony of Harkoon, we had said uh, before when it was still a vibrant, lush kingdom, uh, that there were that there were uh, rivers and lakes and a uh, and just like just lush green lands. But over time, it's uh, we get to a section of history called the Dry Times, where all of these rivers and lakes start to dry up. We see that in the Great Sand Sea, and then it's continuing on in the Shrinking Sea, which is getting right the Red Waste and also, and the Red Waste. Yeah, because and, the Carthine, uh, which are by the way called the Cathai, the people are called the Cathai. They used to have a whole uh, empire here in the Red Waste that, that is now reduced just to Carth. So yeah, like you said, the Great Sand Sea, uh, the Shrinking Sea, and then even the Bleeding Sea, like it's all red there. It's There must be some weird plants or something, but sometimes you get uh, weird conditions in a sea when it does shrink and it becomes saltier and saltier uh, as the evaporation happens, um, if it's a salt sea, a salt lake. So... I'm not sure if that's what's going on there. It's hard to say. But yes, there's widespread evidence for drying up, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And I think what when we think of like the fall of the great empire of the dawn, like you can relate that back to the fall of many empires. Like Rome is the most famous. But I think uh, when we look at the actual characteristics of the great empire as it fell, I feel like it relates a lot more to the decline of the Mongol empire. And this is during the time of the Little Ice Age. Which is didn't which affected Europe and affected Asia, and what you see like you brought up Chinggis Khan, uh, Chinggis Khan definitely the most famous of Khans. Second most famous would be his grandson Kublai Khan, but within seventy years of Kublai Khan's death, the Mongol Empire lost China, and we're going to talk ET, which is our China stand-in here. Within that seventy-year time frame, there were. 10 con or no nine cons i'm sorry nine cons within a 70 year span only one of whom ruled for more than 10 years and in that time during this little ice age uh there you had over within a, again within a 70 year span there were 56 earthquakes uh a drought every two years widespread famine plague uh rebellions and then you couple that with the human element of just the constant corruption within Chinese imperial courts. Uh, you have Mongol Khans emptying out the treasury, just buying lavish gifts for themselves and their families. And so, and, and I feel like this is where we see the great empire. Cause what it says, like each, each successive emperor's reign was shorter and more troubled than the last. And we can see that through like, well, if you take uh, something like the little ice age, which is, and the cause of the little ice age uh, one of the most uh, seems to be a volcano. One think, of the most right? accepted theories yeah. is that is a, a, a volcano eruption, a number of volcano eruptions, but one of the biggest, which was in Indonesia, a super volcano in Indonesia. And this led to not just climate change among the, the Mongol steeps. It has far reaching effects all the way to Great Britain. Like you have uh, the year without a summer in Great Britain and that has been attributed to this one volcano, this one super volcano in Indonesia. Well, if you take like all of that, all those environmental and ecological impacts that come from a volcano, now apply that to something like a, a meteor strike. Even bigger, right? Even bigger. And that's why when we think of like the long night and this black stone that the Bloodstone Emperor uh, worship that fell that fell to earth a meteor strike would have far-reaching effects and it would cause and chain reactions chain multiple reactions. disasters um and the and and i've been binging uh been binging geography videos the past week and uh one of the things i'm, I'm going to answer marlo matthews's question very specifically and also bring up the uh the arm of dorn and ocean currents here that's where i'm going so Mm -hmm. um, when we back up and look at this continent here, some of you, when I first saw this map, I thought it was a little dumb. Uh, like just the fact that it's the continent is just basically all vertical like that, just like Westeros or uh, horizontal, just as Westeros was rectangular and vertical. It's like, yeah, this fits very conveniently on the page, doesn't it? Um, but, and also I looked at those mountains and I was like, oh, these mountains are unrealistic. Um, I, but here's the thing. They actually aren't, um, so first of all, the, 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 the location of the mountains in regard to the, the mother of mountains 
is a direct copying of Robert Jordan and the Wheel of Time. Um, the Mother of Mountains is Dragon Mont, where if, uh, where the the Dragon Reborn is uh, the new one is born on Dragon Mont three thousand years ago. The original Dragon Reborn blew himself up uh, and went crazy, um, and he killed his family, and then uh, got uh, sane enough to realize what he did. He destroyed himself with magic and created this giant mountain called the Dragon Mont. So George is uh, giving a, a big Robert Jordan fan, obviously. He's, so he's doing a, a nod to Robert Jordan. Oh, Danny and Drogon are going to do some sort of epiphany event at the Mother of Mountains. It'll be very much like Rand and his epiphany uh, on Dragonmont, which is a thing that happens. So just to the, just to the east of Dragonmont is a huge wall of mountains. It's, it's the Aiel Waste. And they, they actually have to go in there to do stuff later in the story. But the layout is exactly the same. It's this horizontal mountain range, except for in Wheel of Time, the mountains go on. It's not just a line. They actually go on over a whole region. But so I just want to point out, that's where this map came from. It came from the Wheel of Time. However, to Marla's question, why is there a big ditch next to the mountains? And it looks almost like somebody scooped up the dirt from, from the, you know, from the, the ditch and made the mountains. Well, these are two continental plates. That's what's happening here. This is tectonic activity. The, the way that you get a line of mountains like this, the continent on the further east is going under the one to the west. So the Yi-T side is going under the plate that holds the Dothraki Sea. That is forcing up this whole ridge of mountains, and that's going to lead to depressions on the other side. There also should be volcanic activity happening here and there. And that could have been part of what, why there's a sand sea and not a sea there. It could be that um, there was some, some disasters there, but it doesn't seem like he's worked a lot of volcanism into that. Uh, so I'm just speculating there, but certainly he's to the extent that he's thinking about the pla uh, the planet here, this is a trademark sign of a tectonic plate going under another. Um, that's, we can see that all over the planet, um, things that look like that. It's just a little bigger, essentially. Uh, but then we've got, um, I mean, that's why the Sierra Nevadas, like if you look at California and the Sierra Nevadas, California is this strip of land basically on the other side of the mountains. That plate is going under the Midwestern plate. Same thing in South America. You've got the Andes Mountains running all along the edge of the continent. That's the ocean plate going underneath of it. Um, so... Yeah. Uh, and then and then as far as the shifting climate and the dry times and stuff, well, I think the arm of Dorne is our culprit here mm -hmm. um, in the little ice age and also the younger dryas. The reason why it got so cold is because the ocean currents system collapsed. Um, the reason why Europe is warm, a lot warmer than Canada, of course, is the mid-Atlantic current, which carries warm water up you know, over England, over the top of England, and it keeps the UK warm and everything warm. Um, at various times in our history, that current has shut down and that leads to England freezing over or Europe freezing over, sorry, not England, Europe. And so um, that's what happened during the Younger Dryas. That's what happened to, to a smaller extent. No, obviously there wasn't an ice cap during the, the, the what's the, the mini ice age that you're talking about? It was like 500 AD. I'm talking about the Little Ice Age that yeah. ran between the 14th to 16th centuries. Oh, okay. That's there's been a couple of them. There's um, been a couple. The one yeah. I'm specifically referring to was uh, the more recent 14th uh, that had to do with the volcano eruption in 12. I believe it was 1212 that then had these ecological effects that lasted well into the 16th century. Oh yeah, somebody's a guilty undertaker, right? I've. The most obvious example is probably the Himalayas, which is the Indian subcontinent basically crashing into Asia, and that pushes up the Himalaya mountains. So, yeah. George, and, a little bit of uh, a little bit of basic uh, geology here and stuff. But going back to the Hammer of the Waters, the Hammer of the Waters broke the Arm of Dorne. Of course, if you've ever watched this channel, you know that I'm pretty convinced and think there's a lot of evidence that the Hammer of the Waters was in fact one of the moon meteor impacts of the long night. Hence, George naming one of the Stepstone Islands Bloodstone. It's like a Bloodstone Emperor did it sign. He's the one who remembered as being caused a long night. So you've got this Bloodstone Island in the Stepstones. 
so that kind of makes sense like why did it get so cold during a long night well on a obviously there's magic involved but on a physical level if you collapse the arm of dorn look at what happens before that the narrow sea did not join to the summer sea and the sunset sea and so the narrow sea is really an extension of the shivering sea which is very cold so this narrow sea is going to be a very cold sea and you're not going to have habitable land up here in the north of Westeros, especially on the east coast. This should all be bitter, bitter cold tundra up here. It should not even be habitable. However, I think what's happened is when this arm of Dorne broke open, now you have this currents exchanging. That's going to change the way all of the currents basically all around the world flow, that exchange of warm and cold water. So... This could be what has warmed up some of Westeros and allowed it to even become habitable in, in the first place. I'm not sure how far back George is going with that. But the simple point I want to make is that breaking the arm of Dorne would change global temperatures simply because of changing the ocean currents. So that could be the culprit when we talk about the dry times, um, the freezing mm -hmm. of the long night, and then the warming of the long night. And, and just to finish up this train of thought, and then I'll give it to you, Tim. Antarctica... The reason why it stays frozen all the time is because it's surrounded by the circumpolar current. Um, Antarctica used to be connected to both Australia and South America. And when that was the case, there wasn't an ocean current that could go around the entire Antarctic continent. But once it broke off from South America, which was the most recent disconnection, then the circumpolar current took up. And that, by the way, guys, that's the strongest ocean current in the world by far the current of cold water that isolates antarctica so antarctica will all you know obviously there's issues with global warming and the ice shelves collapsing and stuff but it is it has been frozen for like 50 million years um because of that current um so ocean currents have a huge huge de determinative factor on the climate of the land mm -hmm. and since we're bricked and Again, like since we always, a lot of our conversations always end up this idea of foils and parallelism. When we look at the stepstones, we also have our Eastern version on that, which is the Thousand Islands, which are said to be the remnants of a drowned kingdom. So if you take something like a meteor strike, not only would that cause like mass evaporation of something like the lakes that would once exist in the Peshmer Harkun and then creates the Great Sand Sea, uh, but it would also cause tidal waves in other areas, which the end. So a moon and meteor impact could be the thing that caused the tidal waves further north that drowned what was once the kingdom that is that made up the Thousand Islands. Because like like the stepstones are the remnants of the Arm of Dorne. Thousand Islands might be the remnants of another kingdom that used to border Mossavi. Yeah, and um, I do think that it's logical that the uh, the sea levels are rising because George seems to be copying our own recent Earth history where we're just coming out of an ice age. And 10, you know, 10,000 years ago was the Younger Dryas, which was our own long night. It lasted 1,100 years. But it was, we went from a five or 6,000 year trend of warming to suddenly snapping back to the, the coldest part of the ice age for about 1,100 years. And then it got unstuck and warmed up again pretty quick. Um, obviously, there's a whole thing with they're finding a younger dry as impact theory. It was probably a comet that broke up over the North American ice sheet as well as Europe, yada, yada, yada. Graham Hancock, yeah. Randall Carlson. You guys know that's my jam. Um, but the point is, George seems to be copying that approximate time scale with the long night happening about eight to 10,000 years ago, much as the younger dry as. And since the long night was a freezing up, since then it should be warming. And it seems like that's what's happening with there. We see a lot of drowned land, right? The Arm of Dorne, also the Iron Islands, Thousand Islands, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it seems like there's a cohesive geological story being told, uh, at least on a on a on a loose, basic kind of level. You know, it's not hard, hard science fiction, hard geology, but it's 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 not thoughtless. No. Um, no, so Skunk Works is piping up about a red lake in Bolivia called the Laguna Colorada. And we're going to have a look. Yes, we are. Um, oh, I've got to put it out on its own window. Hang on a second. 
Oh, yes. Insane conspiracy theory. This is the stream to really put on your tinfoil helmets for. Oh, yeah. We're, we're having fun today. You're, we're going to the, the far east of Song of Ice and Fire. So if you're watching the stream, you're ready for this kind of stuff. So here is the Laguna, Colorado. It is a red salt lake in the Andes Mountains. So like I said, I remember I was saying, um, you know, a salt lake that uh, starts drying up is where you can find these kinds of things. So I was I was vaguely remembering something scientific, uh, and here we go. Now, the thing about this lake, just like the Salt Lake um, in Utah, uh, they're at an incredible elevation. So these this is um, a bit of ocean water that got trapped as sea levels and land levels changed a very long time ago. So I'm not sure if the bleeding sea in the east qualifies, but that's probably what we should think of is something like this, right? so then as we're yeah once once we start thinking of like real world examples it, it just it there's so there's so many you can you can think of because george has literally has an entire world to pull from when designing these things or an entire and all this history that he's built that he's building upon for these examples so my head cannon now puts flamingos um at, in the in the bleeding sea Oh, uh, same, same. I figured the bleeding is that, seas probably got huge. Sherpa, flamingo is that blocks. true? Can can you find flamingos? Say yes. I I I said I agree. I agree. In fact, when I first read about the bleeding sea and the explanation of what made it red, the the uh, red plant that that blooms beneath the waters, it I actually had the I immediately thought of flocks of flamingos with uh within those waters. Right. And there's a lake in Australia that's like that, um, where all the, the flamingos are pink because they go to this uh, to this specific lake. Yeah. Anybody know the name? I've known I've got a few Australians in the in the chat. Um, yeah, they get their pink color from the algae that's in the lake. So that sounds more like what George is talking about. Uh, yeah. They eat the krill and the krill eat the algae. Otherwise, they are not pink. So they're not naturally pink like Cleo. Isn't that right, girl? Let me see some Cleo emojis in the chat. Hi, good girl. Hey, Tim, you're, you just got real quiet all of a sudden. Oh, no, I was just... Uh, so there you go. Yeah. No, the volume, your volume dipped for just a few seconds, and then it picked back up. Oh, okay, okay. The Cleo C. Yeah, can't. It's not the bleeding C. It's the Cleo C. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so all right, cool. So let's uh, uh, yeah, let's keep going with uh, get back on our road of travels. <laughs> yes. All right, so once we get past uh, the patron money of Harcoon, we pay we pay our taxes to get through the steel road, the sand road, or, or the stone road, whichever way we're going. Uh, next thing we're going to come upon is the re like what would like to consider itself the successor to the great empire which would be now be the golden empire of yi ti ah yes and yi ti is our uh for most part is our china stand in and i can kind of see lang being like a bit of a if we were to look at a real world like yi ti is china lang is taiwan uh lang yep. was was uh subjugated by yi ti but has since uh, regained its own autonomy and has reintroduced the uh, god empresses of Lang. And then Yi Ti is kind of, uh, I think what George is playing on with, with the current version he has of Yi Ti with the information that we get on it, it seems to be more like the warring states period of China because while Yi Ti is supposed to be uh, ruled by one god emperor, the current god emperor, Bu Gai, uh, his his influence doesn't really extend that far beyond the capital, uh, and he actually has two rival claimants. There is a breakaway general named Paul Ko, uh, the hammer of the Jogos Nai. He set up his own capital further north in Trader Town and has declared himself the first of the Orange Emperors. And then further out in the way, way east in Carcosa, there is a sorcerer lord who claims to be the 69th Yellow Emperor. 
Sorry, I got lost on flamingos here. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Let me reel this back in. Um, so uh, Minty says that they look good in photos, but in real life, they're gross and weird. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, okay, so where were we? I'm sorry, Yt. Yt. Yellow was, Emperor. I was talking about the the God Emperor of Yt. How his his influence has diminished. He real his uh his his influence doesn't extend much further than the capital. And over time, there's become two claimants to him. He has a uh, a breakaway general who's declared himself an Orange Emperor. And then there is a sorcerer lord out in Carcosa who's claiming to be uh, the Yellow Emperor. Right. And and they're essentially trying to squat in the territory of the Great Empire of Dawn. Well, not really the, the territory, but the trappings of. So they're wearing the gold and jade um, that are, you know, obviously classic uh, things associated with uh, uh, Chinese emperors. Um, yeah. but it really seems like they are trying to draw a line of continuity between their history and the great empire of the dawn history first and foremost and i've got some excellent yt artwork to share while we talk about et this is called yt gate by henrik zaringer actually all three of these are going to be by henrik zaringer so this is a this is a jungle sanctuary because we're told their jungles are filled with ruins many of which are built upon older and older ruins, as humans tend to do. Here's the Yi Ti Hills. So you imagine this is north of north of the countryside, getting closer to the Five Forts. And then, of course, here is your Yi Ti downtown, if you will. So it's pretty awesome culture. Uh, you know, obviously, China is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, contiguous civilization quote unquote, obviously gets sticky when you talk about what what the definition of, you know, civilization is or contiguous or uh, <laughs> um, anything like that. However, they've been they've been they have a very they're a very old and traditional culture, uh, you know, and, and what's cool about Chinese cultures, of course, you think of comets and dragons are both heavily associated with them. The, the Chinese uh, were able to they were one of the earliest peoples that made records of comets and uh, other bits of astronomy. And of course, dragons primarily come from Eastern culture, like Indian, Iranian, uh, Chinese, and other, other Asian cultures. So I feel like it, it kind of makes sense to slot the great empire of the dawn and the ancient dragon lord mysteries under the umbrella of this part of the world. To me, it's, it fits pretty well. Yeah, and as you're saying, like uh, when Yi T does claim to be like this great successor to the Great Empire, and we see that through the titles of their emperors, like the Azor Emperors, the Sea Green Emperors, these are like while vibrant colors in their own right, they are kind of like a lesser version of the gemstones of that the emperors of the Great Empire are originally taking titles from. Exactly. So but, go ahead and talk about ET a little bit, and I'm going to um, fortify myself against COVID and honor Garth Green. One second. Take it away, Tim. All right. So uh, I actually am getting corrected in the comments. So, so the warring states period be radicalized. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, that probably would the three king the three kingdoms would be a better analogy given given the context of things. Um, so what I was, what I, what I'm trying to get at when, but uh, bringing up the three emperors though, is I think what George is trying to get at with these three emperors is it's kind of a foil to the war of the five Kings. Um, because I think what we can do is when we think of the five forts and what exactly is going on in the five forts, I think we can use the wall as a great example and kind of glean what the wall situation was during the war of the five Kings to give a situation as to what the uh, what might be going down in the five forts currently with what's with the current political situation in YT, because YT, along with having a weak god emperor at the helm, and these break these uh, this breakaway general and these other claimants, 
Yeet, we're also told by uh, the sailors in Planky Town that Yee T is currently experiencing an outbreak of gray plague. So that's a that's also playing into Yeet, uh, Yee T's current into the problems of the God Emperor in uh, trying to keep in trying to ferment his rule over this. Yeah, it's it's tough, man. It's tough being on top. It is. Um, and uh, of course, the Yellow Emperor out in Carcosa, that's a whole different line of uh, of research um, as far as what George is referring to there, which we'll get into in a second. Um, yeah. Real quick, I want to show the people. I've got just a little bit of Jade. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Uh, it just looks black. This is probably not going to. It's really cool looking in person. Um, pull up some photos of Jade, just if, you, if you're curious. And I got a couple little gold nuggets here. It's me gold. Oh, there it goes. It focused. It's gold. All right. So Jade and gold, the trappings of the Yeetish emperors. Um, now, well, the thing about Yeet is like, even though they've had trouble maintaining a huge empire, they've, they have maintained their own existence for all of this time. And they've got some of the oldest records in the world. One of the first places that language was developed. Oh, Tim, I'm sorry, dude. No, <laughs> there <sorry>. you are. <laughs> um, and uh, <clears throat> if it's one of the places where there's lots of knowledge and old knowledge. So, you know, Dana's going to use the glass candle. She'll probably find her lost knowledge from a shy. But Yee Tee is a place where if you've met a traveler from Yee Tee or, um, you know, something like that, then you could pick up some some very ancient knowledge. Uh, if, if you were a maester, for example, and you went there to study, that's where you'd find out some good stuff. Now, there's a weird story of uh, one of the Yeetish emperors married a Valerian and kept a dragon at his court. And this this could be just a random story, but I always took this as evidence of Great Empire of the Dawn Dragon Lord status because it's like, why would the Yeetish think that's cool? You know, mm -hmm. well, because they descend from the Great Empire of the Dawn and somewhere there are probably, George didn't give them to us, but I'm sure the Yeetish scribes know about Great Empire of the Dawn theory, if we could ask them. Um, if it's right, they would know. So yeah, the idea that like a Yeetish emperor kept a, had a Valerian queen and a dragon at his court, like, and everyone was like, yeah, that's cool, man. Because that's a call out to the great empire. And like we've been saying, they are very much trying to carry that mantle more than anyone else. So. Yeah. And. Unfortunately, they've got the great plague there now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gray so, waste is one thing. Gray plague is entirely another. Yeah. So, so Yee is currently experiencing just like a number of a number of political issues, which happens, which which tends to happen when you have a weak. Which is again another parallel that I think George would want us to think about was, was what happens when the man in charge is weak because Westeros is currently under Tommen, but Tommen's really not ruling. It's Cersei who's in charge of all of that. And we're told that along with uh, Bugai's weakness, along with the claimants like Paul Co and the Sorcerer Lord, E.T. is kind of un is really being run more by the courts, more by the courts. So you have like all of these scheming, conniving, uh, like what are the words? like ma ma magisters? Like mm -hmm. we we could think of like a E.T. ish version of Illyrio Mopatis, like who's like. Just uh, really Absolutely. trying to run it, run everything. Yeah, George has shown us that there those creatures are everywhere. Little finger, yes. Illyrio, little finger, the, yeah. the little fingers, the various blood raven in his time, even. Mm -hmm. And yep. then, so Go when ahead. we oh, and then so when we move on from ET, that's when we actually get to the five forts. And when I was talking before, I was saying like the five forts. You can't discuss the five forts without mentioning ET because currently. The five forts function. Their original function, if we believe the legends, when they were raised by the Pearl Emperor, was to guard against the demons of the Lion of the Night. And this is all stuff that happens before the long night that were, I mean, the demons of the Lion of the Night. 
But this is all stuff that kind that takes place thousands of years before the the long night that we know of, because the Bloodstone Emperor is another is another eight dynasties down or eight not dynasties eight well potentially dynasties right yeah or rulers but, but he's so, another eight rulers down from the per, from the time the pearl emperor comes into play so before we get into this because this is some of the meat here this is gonna this is gonna be a a meaty a meaty next 20 minutes or so i, I have a feeling let me uh real quick say thank you from the bottom of my heart to vince to ryan and to Miranda, who have all sent in computer donations. No questions, just computer donations. So I just want to say thank you very much for sending those in via PayPal. Um, also, Samantha, who also goes by Cinnabarb and does have a question. The Bones Mountains are standing for the Himalayas. Yeah, it's like we were talking. One does not go under the other in this instance. You're correct in describing the uplift of the Andes Mountains. Also, massive uplift of the crust also causes massive erosion. See the Grand Canyon. Right. So, okay. So, if the plates don't, one doesn't go under the other, they can also just sort of smash together and well up. Is that kind of what's happening? Essentially, the land is getting smushed and crinkled and forced up. Yeah. So, I was moving fast around the continental plates of the world. But yeah, there's, there's various kinds of faults, uh, scenarios that can create mountains. So, um, this now this one here with the bones, Cinnabarb. Let me know. Do you do you see strong evidence that it's one kind of fault or the other? I don't. Just for what it's worth, um, I'm not sure if there's a uh, if they if it looks a little different when it goes under versus sort of smashes together and wedges up. Um, this th the fact that the mountain range is so narrow to me makes it. That's why I was thinking it's going under. Because when they smash together, like at the Himalayas, you get a sort of a longer crinkled up region, um, I believe. But obviously, I'm an amateur <laughs> geologist who's learned learned on YouTube. So don't, uh, you know, grain of salt and all that stuff. So the ge my, I know I've got a few geologists in the chat if anybody wants to speak up about faults and which, which kind of fault is likely to explain these mountains. That would be cool. Um, but yeah, so there's the PayPal's. Now let's go back over to the five forts. Um, somebody asked earlier in the chat, obviously we were talking about the idea of is there a wall between them? And we said probably it would seem silly to build such huge forts and not connect them with a wall. It's just that the wall isn't mentioned because it's probably just an average wall and the forts themselves are kind of the show stealers. Um, somebody said, well, you could just go around it to the north. Well, if we back up, it's not a matter of just going around. Yeah, that's um, a it's a lot of land to cover. That's and also and then once you go north, look what you run into: the cannibal sands, the sands. and the gray waste. So, <laughs> I'm not sure why those are called the cannibal sands, but <laughs> you can go and find out if you want to. And uh, the gray waste is a, called a frozen desert. So we've got desert deserts and a frozen desert, um, and that's if you can get through the land of the Shrikes and Kadath. So I don't think just going around is the way to put it. Um, I think that the only way to get through this pass is right where the five forts are. You can see it's a pretty narrow area, you know, if, unless you, because you've got the dry deep right there. So it's probably even hard to get into the mountains of the Morn. Uh, if you've got a guide, maybe you could pick your way through there and go around the forts, but that's probably really difficult. So... Yeah, they've bottled up the only way mm -hmm. for the monsters of the further east to get into Yi-T. And as you said, supposedly the five forts were built before the Long Night. So that indicates there were some sort of demons or monsters prowling about the world out here before the Long Night. So we don't know what those are, if those are others or something else. But Yeah. Again, like it's hard to go on because we're told that the five forts were raised by the Pearl Emperor, but we're also told that the Pearl Emperor ruled for a thousand years. So for me, I don't think to have something as massive and grand of a scale as the five forts would take multiple lifetimes. So I would see it more likely that this was a project overseen by 
a number of different emperors unless yeah. we are unless we are to take these legends literally and actually believe that someone lived for a thousand years well the other thing is they're made with fused stone so fused stone is something you could work with quicker the thing is you still have to bring the stone there yeah so fusing it is how you shape it but you unless there's a quarry right there you got to bring the stone there it's a thousand feet high whatever so obviously it was it was brought in um also, if those if those emperors are dynasties, then raised by the Pearl Emperor just means raised by the people of the Pearl Emperor clan, which could have taken any number of successive rulers or or decades to build. And yeah, it, we're, we should think of things like the pyramids and other stuff that were definitely long civic projects. And then, so the five forts, like like how we're talking, like you can't just go around because they combine where they're situated. They combine with the mountains of the Morn and the Bleeding Sea as these natural formations to create this whole barrier that basically div that divides the further east away from Yt, and would have divided them away from the Golden Empire, from the Great Empire. So the question becomes, like, well, what was the necessity for these forts? What exactly is it that's out east? Because that's where things really start to get weird. So here's a great comment um, by iDash, uh, who has a cool looking black sun icon. I'm going to assume, similar to the Wall of Westeros, that the five forts are today keeping a separate human settlement that found themselves, keeping out a separate human settlement that found themselves on the wrong side of a rising border. So yes, this we should think about this, right? Because George builds a magical ice wall and shows us ice demons. True. But he also shows us that the wildlings are just people who are on the wrong side of a wall. And of course, the others are named the others because George wants to talk about the theme of otherization, which is when you take a foreign people and tell stories about them until they turn into monsters and they are dehumanized and they become an enemy that you are justified in killing uh, or warring against. That is the process of otherization George obviously is begging us to think about that by calling the others the others and then having all of the, you know, John's chapters with you grit and, and letting us see the wildlings are just first men caught on the wrong side of the wall. So whether or not there are shrikes and other magical things out here, this is a really good insight and we should wonder about this. Um, that yellow emperor out in Kadath sounds like a person and he's got a, people that live there. It's a city. Right. So like there are people out there. What can you tell us about Kadath, both what we hear about in World of Ice and Fire proper and what George is referencing with Kadath? All right. So uh, Kadath seems to be if we look at the map, it's pretty much like the only city within the Grey Waste. And Kadath is lifted from Lovecraft it's from a dream quest of unknown Kadath. Uh, in George's version, Kadath is said claims to be the oldest city that it was the first city and that it'll that it will always remain and that's a big i mean that's a big claim to make because that's something that that's another claim that yt would rather would would rather say that like no we're the first city so but kadath uh in george's version it says that this is a land where unspeakable rights are formed to sedate mad gods and but in in Lovecraft's version of Kadath, it's left ambiguous as to whether Kadath exists in the real world or if it exists in the dreamlands. It kind of sits on the periphery. And I think that's why George, uh, with his version, mm. with his Kadath, like, I think he was very deliberate in its I placement. See. Right. Because, because he places it right where we would say, quote unquote, civilization ends. It being right. the very first city immediately east of the gray of the gray of the five forts that's cool yeah and if you want you could even go on to speculate about you know ancient ashai and kadath being connected or being rivals you know as the great empire was first arising even um so yeah uh that's uh yeah so it's definitely it's a lovecraft reference it is a city but it's it's very much it's it's essentially the ashai of lovecraft world um, except for it's a million years old or whatever it's supposed to be. So, um, but the thing about Kadath is we're told that it 
even though it sits up past the five forts, it being a city would mean that it is being populated by a people. But for whatever reason, it's a people that the current that the current powers that be in ET want to keep out. Uh, it's also said that the five forts are currently serving to uh, protect ET from raiders out of the gray waste. And when we think of raiders out of the gray waste, well, that just that sounds a lot like wildlings. That sounds a lot like the free folk. It really does. So it seems like the whole setup has been copied. Not only demons and a wall, but also like the more mundane truth is there too. So what about Bone Town? What is what do they tell us about Bone Town? Is that a place you can go? Uh, yeah, Bone Town is a well, it's a rumored city that's said to be made entirely out of bone. Uh, that the people that live there have kind of like a whole economic system based on bones, where they trade bones that they find in the canyon below it, the dry deep. Uh, when it comes to that, I think what George is doing is he's playing with this idea of uh, of a pre of a prehistoric era that existed before man. Because when I think the dry deep and these bones of like these strange creatures, uh, it makes me actually think a lot about dinosaurs. Uh, the dry deep reminds me, of, and with it being situated in a freezing desert like the Gray Waste and around the Cannibal Sands, it harkens to like the Gobi Desert of real uh, in the real world. The Gobi Desert is one of the most fossil rich areas in the real world. So the, basically, it's just some archaeologists living out there in Bone Town just wish they could keep out of all the bloody wars between the yellow emperor and the Yeetish emperor. Just let them dig up the bones and study them. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, that's the case with a lot of the, some of the oldest um, interesting sites about human development are of course in the middle East and in the foothills of Turkey and Syria and places where you can't, uh, it's not always safe to go. Also in Africa, the Rift Valley, um, you know, gotta worry about those Ethiopian pirates and shit. Uh, so, like, yeah, it's it's hard to do archaeology out there in the world. Sometimes you feel for those guys in Bone Town. Um, yeah, what we're talking and then there's the city of Winged Men hiding down there. What's going on with that? Um, Amanda from Crow Food's daughter, when she was talking about her um, her video about the origin of the blood of the dragon, which I piggybacked off of with my Dracomorph theory. She was pointing out that a lot of the the things that we hear about out here sound like failed Blood of the Dragon experiments. Um, somebody with wings, maybe mm -hmm. that's little dragon wings, like the deformed lizard babies. Um, there's the Shrikes. Shrikes are basically lizard people. Um, bloodless men. Uh, I believe some of the lizard babies don't have blood. I can't quote me on that. I'm just trying to think. And well, Danny's baby was dead, so I guess it was a bloodless baby. That's a bit of a stretch, but there was a bunch of stuff I don't remember all of. Check out the, the Disputed Lands, of course, her two Blood of the Dragon videos. I talk about them all the time. Um, but yeah, some of these, if there are freaks and monsters out here, they very well could be the result of whatever horrible experiments led to the Blood of the Dragon. Um, we know the Valerians carried out all kinds of freaky deaky experiments on Gagasos. They made enslaved people with animals. Obviously they were using blood magic to do that. Um, we don't know if they're trying to, that was in the process of trying to make the blood of the dragon or trying to do the similar kind of magic and experiment further. But the point is a lot of the freaks and monsters that we find around here are most likely the result of weird magic experiments um and that goes for sothorios as well yeah that's i was on uh that's something i had in the notes but both for the land of the shrikes and the city of wigan men was the idea that perhaps these are uh the 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 remnants of uh past blood rituals from the great empire these chi these chimera like experiments these are maybe like things that escaped made it further out east and just kind of like we're able to continue on and populate and just create pop just create populations of their own but then other suggestions that i've seen like that if we think of the city of the wing men that if it is actual men that maybe it's men who are using some kind of gliders because the city of wing men is situated on the mount on um, the mountains of the morn but if it is the lower peaks if they have some form of gliders then they might be using that to like hop from hills to hills 
Yeah, um, I dig that. And in fact, in Pseudo Atlantis, uh, the fantasy story that I'm going to write, which would be kind of like Atlantis, but not. They're going to have gliders because gliders are cool, man. I dig it. That's oh, all yeah, I have to say about that. But <laughs> so oh, yeah, then so there's Carcosa all the way down there, which is another Lovecraft reference. Um, so look, at, on at a cursory glance, it seems like what George is doing is just populating uh, the far corners of the East here with quote unquote hat tips to Lovecraft. But let's 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 try to think a little harder about this. What is George really saying? by putting these places out there. I think you started to hit on it when you said, talked about how, um, uh, what's a, what's a Kadath is like on the edge of reality and not reality. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, and yeah. Then, what do you, what, what is, what is George doing here? What kind of ideas is he summoning up by, by tapping into Carcosa, Carcosa and Kadath and things like that? Well, I think what he's doing is, I think he's crying is he's creating a bit of his own ode to the dreamlands, and but he's also definitely playing up this idea of well, these are the cities that we're given, and these are the descriptions we're given, but who are we getting them from? We're getting them from maesters who have never been out this far. Uh, George, in his in own inter in his own interviews, has said like it's the like when someone. It was during one of his Q and A's when someone had asked him, "Why are there no children in a shy?" And he had said, "Well, who's telling you that information? It's the maesters." And the maesters, it's it's like try and try and think of an example of like uh, he compared it to a monk who's who's at a monastery in Germany who's probably never left Germany, probably never even left his own hometown. But this is the guy who's going to tell you about Vietnam. So it's like this is the information. A lot, like a, so much of this can just be hearsay, can just be conjecture, can just be rumor. We really have no way of knowing. And I think that's that's the thing that George is really trying to get at is that are these cities real? Are they are these literal? Are these just rumors? We don't know because the people that we rely on to write about it have no have no knowledge. They have no primary sources that they can that they can take from. They have no way of observing to see exactly what's out there to be able to interview the people that actually live there to get a sense. And it's the same way how we, how in real life, like the whole, there be dragons out here. Sometimes right. th things like this were, were taken as fact. Or if you see like, <laughs> if you've ever seen those drawings of someone trying to draw a giraffe that's never seen a giraffe but had like a sailor explain to them what a giraffe looks like and it looks like this <laughs> horrible mutant dog i like, used to the, draw the, those the, in junior high school we used, we used to have fun um yeah <laughs> I, I think that's what george is is really getting at with these with these things is that it is it, it kind of is a dreamland in all of its own because you don't know what's real because you have no way of knowing if it's real there's no way for the maesters in old town to get any kind of real information aside from actually going out and visiting these places. And that's why we have such a respect for Marwin the mage, because he's someone who can at least say, I actually have been to a shy. So right. I can tell, I can tell you what's on the up and up. I don't yeah. know how far, I don't know if he's gone any further East than a shy, but he can at least say that he's been there and can tell us what's real and what's rumor. So I think what's what essentially George is doing here is he's doing two things at once. One, he likes to play with, he loves the foolishness of people. He likes how people want to believe in prophecy and fool themselves into thinking they're the hero of their own story, like Theon or Quentin. Uh, he loves talking about how the maesters are overly skeptical and so they miss the magic. Uh, and then, you know, the common people will believe, you know, wise tales and things like that. Like he's playing a lot with belief and deception all through the story. So he very much wants to reproduce that here, there be dragons thing. Like, oh, well, that's off the edge of human knowledge. Otherwise it wouldn't feel like an ancient world. You know, information should be limited when you go to the far reaches. It's harder to travel back then, harder to exchange information. However, this is also a world with magic. Mm -hmm. So we know that when the maesters in the world of ice and fire poo-poo the others and the children of the forest and various things, we already know that they're wrong. 
So the same thing is true here. Um, and that way, Georgia's created a gray area, a gray waste, if you will, mm -hmm. um, uh, of, of doubt where we're not sure. Some of these are likely to be exaggerations, but they're also some of them are likely to be real magical monsters. And then there will also be people like the wildlings who have been people think are monsters and who aren't. So it's all kind of mixed up. That is essentially George's brand or flavor of fantasy. That was how, that is how he combines the realism of people's belief and the magical elements. It's, it's sort of asking the question, in a world with magic, how much worse would the problem of people believing whatever be? And, yeah. and that's what is that's what is showing us, you know. So he usually does like to hide see, like all the rumors that people say about the wildlings. <clears throat> they're like not really true. They're kind of true. But if you study them, there's more like George is hiding magical clues about the others and blood magic and stuff like that inside of them. So similarly, when we look at all these monsters out here, that's why I like Amanda's idea, the way that she's thinking as far as well. These kind of sound like somebody was trying to make dragon people and uh, and there were some some failed experiments here, which is yeah. what would happen if you were trying to make dragon people with blood magic. There would be failed experiments, you know? Yeah. Uh, I also think like when we think of something like the city, of the wingman on a narrative level, maybe it's more. Um, maybe it's not so much literal, but more metaphorical because we've seen like Greek green seers. Uh, we've they talk like Veramir Sixkins talks about the the skin changers that are more prone to skin changing birds, how they are like lost in thought because they always want to fly. Well, yeah. maybe the city, the city of the winged men. Maybe winged men is great. It is a type of uh, skin changer that is predominantly skin changing birds. And maybe their entire culture has become like birded out, like like my house. <laughs> <laughs> my entire culture has been birded out. Uh, Dave is a winged man, confirmed. <laughs> confirmed. Uh, and also, uh, and as for the land of the strikes, well, George, in his. Keep it going, Tim. Be right back. One second. Uh, well, and another thing with the land of the strikes is George has, we've talked before about George and these ideas of diverging evolution, like with the men of Ib, how sometimes they're, uh, some people could see them as a form of Neanderthal, but also I talked about this in my own stream. Uh, so hit my own stream, uh, Carcosa and Beyond. It was a live reading I did last night where I read a, uh, Ambrose Fierce, uh, some short stories by Robert W. Chambers and five Lovecraft tales. And in between, I kind of made some commentaries in between reading these, but I had, what is with my camera? Oh, my camera got misty because I got excited and was talking real fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I was getting at is, uh, George does these takes on like divergent evolutions, like the men of Ib as Neanderthals and uh -huh. the me the megafauna that we see, like or auroxes are still alive. Dire wolves, yeah, totally. Dire wolves. Uh, well, in in his description of Sothorios, he has along with the wyverns, he also has these descriptions of these lizard creatures that sound a lot like raptors. So it seems like. In, and he even yeah. says, like, uh, the Sea Lord of Bravos keeps one of them in his menagerie. <laughs> that's so, that's the crazy part, yeah. Yeah, but it <laughs> seems like there, there are spots where dinosaurs might still be alive, and that could be what the land of the Shrikes is. These just yeah, that's also true. Maybe they're not, like, Liz, or maybe, if they're not a failed experiment, they could just be a natural fauna of this desert of just these giant lizard creatures. <laughs> Yeah, and, I've, got, I've got my Robert Muldoon jokes happening here. Clever girl. <laughs> but George did that, uh, if we go even further east or further west, depending on which direction you want to look, look at, uh, the three islands of Aegon, Rhaenys, and uh, Visenya that Alyssa Farman had discovered, yeah. they're populated by lizard creatures which sound all very much like Komodo dragons. Yes. Yes. yes and, I, know, I remember that. And also, uh, this is the thing, wild pigs. And this is what makes me think that gives even more evidence of this whole idea that the Great Empire was visiting Westeros even before the fall. Uh, if you know pigs, you know that pigs are very hardy. Uh, and a big thing with actual British and Spanish explorers, probably all, 
numerous explorers would leave pairs of breeding pigs on islands be and because of how versatile they are, especially on islands where they have no natural predators, you leave a few breeding pairs of pigs, come back like a year or two later, and the entire island is going to be populated. It's going to be swarming with pigs. And then that makes these islands good land stops to make because you can have, uh, you can stop, have a rest and have plenty of pigs to hunt and load up on on pork to fill with and then salt it and fill larders. And that's a great thing for these long sea travels. I'm sorry. I've just got my eye on the 49ers game. The refs are trying really hard to give this game to the Cowboys. They must have gotten the call from the commissioner here, but I'm sure that we will handle our business. Uh, carry on. Okay. But yes, the, the, there, so those pigs are all inbred. They only left one Adam and Eve pig on the island. So those are all inbred pigs and therefore they're dragon riding pigs. And that's why they're on the islands named after the uh, three dragon lords. So confirmed. But or something. But, I don't know. No, but like when we like when we really think like like I did love that though, just to go back. Yeah. I really did like that. Like the fact that they found pigs on those islands means that people have come through that way before, right? Yeah, and it's probably when we think of like the uh the base of the high tower, the black few stone. That's on Battle Isle, and that being one of the uh, hints that we, the hints of evidence that we have that the Great Empire had visited Westeros even before the times of the First Men. Well, if they're making these long sea voyages, then it makes sense that they would stop at these islands, leave some breeding pairs of pigs behind, and then that way, on their way back, they'd have a place to stop and eat and, bacon. Uh, yeah. yeah, eat bacon. Yeah, and re reload uh, for the remaining travel over the east. Yeah, now those motherfuckers would have been called the Bacon Islands. Yeah. Now it's it's possible that George, if he if he were to expand, like maybe maybe there's a North and South America type continent in the way, but I think that those islands get like tend to lead evidence that if you were to sail west from Westeros, that you eventually would land in Essos. Like I'm I'm firmly on that train. That's that going west will eventually lead to the east. Yeah, but, I, I definitely think Alyssa Farman did it, if nothing else. Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm on the board that what Corliss Valerian saw in the ports at a shy was the sun chaser. That yeah, she, this is fantasy, guys. I always tell people like this isn't the real world. When you're given loose pieces of information that sound like they relate to one another, they do. It's a story. You're so like it's you're supposed to put this shit together. That's the, that's how you write a story. And that's anyway. why when it when it comes to a character like uh, like Quaif, when people try and people say like, well, who really is Quaif? I could, some people like the idea that it's Shear, a sea star. Others like that it's Alyssa Farman. I'm more of a fan of the Alyssa Farman, but I would still be very happy with it being Shear, a sea star. But I think, but I will say like, I think Alyssa Farman made it. I think she made it across the Sunset Sea, eventually found land and ended up in it and ended up in a shy. Like that, that's, that's where I'm put. That's where I would hedge my bets. I'm down. I'm down with it. And uh, the bigger question that everyone wants to ask is, did the Great Empire of the Dawn come that way? Because the only Great Empire of the Dawn settlements in Westeros are in Starfall, Old Town, and potentially the Iron Islands. Mm -hmm. So that's all on the the west coast of Westeros. Now the and thing is. If the arm of Dorne broke during the long night, that means when the Great Empire of the Dawn was doing their thing, the narrow sea would have been cut off from them. Um, we don't know if Dorne was a desert back then. It may have been different. But of course, there's famously no safe harbor once you pass Sunspear um, all the way to Starfall. So it could be that they, they sailed the conventional way um, through the summer sea here. And then they just went around Dorne and they didn't land until Starfall because that was the first place that was the good, you know, Starfall and Old Town. Those were the good ports. But it could be, of course, that from a shy, they went through the Saffron Straits and they popped out on the ocean and they hit Westeros right here by Old Town because that was the that's the first place they came to. And so that, and that's also why they hit the Iron Islands. So they're scattered here on the West Coast. So it's a pretty good theory. The one thing I will point out is that 
the whole point of the Great Empire of the Dawn is that they're the ancestors of Valyria, right? They were the first dragon lords, and that's where the Valerians learned and got their stuff and whatever, whatever. So that kind of says that they sailed through the summer sea if they left, if they found, you know, you know part of their descendants founded an empire in Valyria. It could be that these are people that left the Great Empire of the Dawn after the long night when everyone scattered and they just sailed from there and then found Valyria. But more likely, I'm thinking the Great Empire of the Dawn had already established a beachhead there, and then some of the survivors would have essentially fled there and flowered anew, just as with uh, Hightower. And, ah, the rest did not succeed. Niners iced it. Go Niners. Sorry, Cowboys. All right. And that concludes the football commentary of the day. But uh, yay, sports ball. Um, so, yeah, so the, it's a pretty open mystery. They could have gone either way. There's evidence on both sides. George definitely is at least wanting to play with the idea. Yeah. Um, and I think the most important one is that is that Alyssa Farman made it and therefore may be Quave. And the reason why it makes sense for her to be Quave is because Alyssa Farman, um, first of all, uh, her whole life has been connected to the, the Targaryens. Uh, she loved a Targaryen. And she stole the eggs that are almost certainly the eggs that Danny hatched. So if she's advising Danny, then a couple of things. She's probably seeing in Daenerys an echo of what she saw in, uh, I guess it's Rainies, right? That Alyssa dated it was a Rainies. Yeah, There's so many yeah. similar names. I believe it was a Rainies. Um, either, it was either Raina or Rainies. And so you. When Quaithe is helping Danny, she's looking at Danny as a descendant of her lost lover. Maybe she felt guilty about fleeing with those eggs to some extent. And it's a sort of poetic return to that whole story. And uh, yeah, so it is Raina. And, yeah, Raina. Uh, and yeah, the fact that Alyssa Farman put the eggs into play and then helped Danny raise the dragons, you know, later, that's pretty, um, that's pretty cool. So I, I'm on board with all that. Shout out to Painkiller Jane, by the way, who put a lot of that together. And uh, so, like, when we think, like, the fall of the Great Empire, I I could see, like, when you're talking such a gigantic landmass, like a literal empire, once it falls, I could see the people that are trying to escape it going in all different directions. The people that are closest to the bones are going to try and get over the bones. But the people that are further away, if they're more on the five fort side, that they're pro then maybe they might try to actually go out east and think, well, maybe I might be, I might actually have better chances despite all the monsters and stuff. If it's actually because they would also again like go into this idea of like who's telling us these are all monsters out here? It's the maesters. Well, the people that are actually living there probably have a better idea of what's really out in the far east, and they might have taken their chances out on that. And that's why I can see like I have this. I bring up the idea of the first men of the East, like House Dane and House Hightower, because House Dane gets lumped in with as a first man house, even though there's all this evidence pointing that they are a great empire of the Dawn people. And House Hightower, even the Maesters admit that House Hightower predates uh, the predates the first men, that they're Correct. people from the sailors and traders who were gathering in the Whispering Sound. And as for the first men, at least the ones that crossed the arm of Dorne, it says that they were not men who had ships. But if they didn't have ships, then how could they settle places like the Iron Islands or Starfall? Because Starfall is an island. You can't really notice it on the map, but Starfall is an island. Yeah, it is. So you would have to have some, if not a, even if not a ship, you'd at least have to have some kind of boats to be able to paddle out there. And the Iron Islanders themselves reject the notion that they're that they're descended from first men because they have their cultural belief that they came from the sea. Right. So and the High Towers are descended from seafaring traders, and the Ironborn say they're not from Westeros, and they also have seafaring skill. And the first men are we're told very specifically that they have no seafaring skill. That's again one of those things where like clearly the author is trying to lead you in a direction here. Yeah. Um meaning seafaring peoples came to Westeros, left their descendants before the first men or at the same time as the early first men. And some of those first men, quote unquote, aren't first men. 
I always yeah. like to point out that the term first men is most likely an Andal term that they applied to everyone who was there before them when they got there. Because the various tribes of Westeros, there was tons of petty kings. They would not have thought about themselves as one cohesive culture. They had never been a unified nation. And so it, it, that's often the case when you go back in history is you find tribes of people that we now refer to as one culture, but then you listen to the historians and, and they have to say, oh, well, the people of that time, they wouldn't have thought about themselves as one nation or culture. They were just people who shared common traits and ancestry in the same area, but they oftentimes went to war with one another, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of what we're uh, talking about here. Yeah, with because, uh, with all these descendants in in Westeros, there's there's uh, when the Andals got there, they just threw a blanket over everyone that wasn't an Andal and said, "Oh, those are the first men." And by that time, and I'm not uh, into those theories about the Andals getting their way earlier. I hate those theories. I think they're terrible. Um, uh, but uh, I basically what happened is by the time the Andals got to Westeros, whatever uh, Great Empire of the Dawn or whoever the Ironborn descendant you know ancestors were, they essentially have been, you know, intermarrying, you know, becoming first men for however many centuries or, or eons. Mm -hmm. So by the time the Andals got there, the, the lines probably weren't as clear, but it's pretty clear that the Danes do stand out from everyone else in Dorne. And there's plenty of clues about the high towers too. So, yeah. And it's just because like, because first men is such a vague term, like at least with the Andals and the Royanar, you can trace them back to a geographic region where they- Right, it's not the name of a people, it's a descriptor, it's exactly. A descriptor. So it's really, it's it's really like, they really, when you think first men, it's like, well, they really could have came from anywhere. And that's why I'm of that belief that the first men, that it came, that it was multiple different migrations, that they came in waves and that they came in from all different directions, not just from the Arm of Dorne, that there were some coming in from the east across the Sunset Sea. Yeah, it seems like George is riffing off of um, kind of like European history here, where, you know, you've got the proto-Indo-European uh, migration waves, the Andronovo and the Bell Beaker culture and stuff moving out over Europe. But it wasn't all one invasion. It was like, you know, like people, um, these the proto-Indo-European were horse people, and that made them more mobile. And so they gradually spread out into Europe um, and there was a lot of different kinds of scenarios. So peaceful integration, gradual integration, the tr lots of trading. Cause you bring horses in, you're the first people with horses. Like that's a commodity. You can mm -hmm. trade the stuff that's there. And then thousands of years before that, the first farmers came out of the middle East and the Turkey in, and, and like, uh, Tur you know, what is now Turkey and swept across, uh, Europe and and mixed with the hunter gatherers that were there um but that wasn't a, just a displacement either um you saw a lot of cases the hunter gatherers essentially learned farming from the farmers and the farmers traded some of their stuff for hunter gatherer goods and various permutations of cultures uh, sprang up so when we're talking about the first men george has brought them all the way back to the silver sea area and said that they may have originated around the silver sea or they may have originated kind of in the Andalos, Norvos, Northern Forest area. It's very vague, but I think the Silver Sea idea is right. And the Silver Sea used to occupy, you know, this area where these two lakes are in Sarnor, potentially mm -hmm. much bigger, reaching all the way to the womb of the world. Um, that's hard to say. Uh, Disputed the Lands has a video about that too. Yeah, that's um, where the point we get is, these myths of like the Fisher Queens. Yeah, that's a. I need to make a video about the Fisher Queens. That's good stuff. Um, but basically, the 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 bulk of the first men are some sort of Germanic people, Proto Indo European people. Obviously, they're white people with kind of darker looks, speaking loosely. Um, so that kind of fits with the Proto Indo Europeans. Um, and that's yeah. So I think you're right, Tim, to speculate that there were probably waves of migration. And I'm on the, I'm actually on the wrong map. Let me um talk about this map real quick so I can get rid of it. This is the Great Empire of the Dawn borders. And this is how I figured out that Ashai is probably in the Great Empire of the Dawn. They tell you the borders are the Bones in the east, the Shivering Sea to the north, the Gray Waste to the I'm sorry, the Bones to the west. 
and the the gray waste to the east and then the jade sea to the south so they don't really tell you the Ashai peninsula is very vague it doesn't they don't you know they don't say the mountains of the morn and even the shy it's it's inside the mountains of the morn really um yeah. and and i was saying that if the great empire of the dawn occupied lang which is an island then that means they're mobile and they would have been able to get to a shy at the very least we've also seen that overland caravans can go um from jinki uh, jinqui and the yt area to a shy that's how mary master got there by caravan not by sea so you can reach a shy by sea or by caravan and it's it looks to me like it's well within the area of the Great Empire of the Dawn. And the fact that the Great Empire of the Dawn is described as a huge civilization and Ashai is the biggest city ever built kind of makes you think, well, probably one built the other. Um, otherwise, Ashai was this huge city that would have had a supporting civilization that was living basically right over top of the Great Empire of the Dawn. So it makes more sense to think that was the same civilization. Um, and so that this is my border map here. Let me get rid of this and bring back up the full map so I can go back to Westeros. Uh, oh, shit. Not video. Uh, no. Mountains of the Moon are the ones that are in the Vale. Uh, yes. CB Norwood. Why do I keep hitting? There are, there are a Mountains of the Moon. That, that's the Vale of Aaron. Oh, right. So we were just talking about... Before I deviated back to a shy, we were talking about, oh, right, the waves. So the Andals, they're, I mean, no, the first men, they're moving across Essos over the arm of Dorne. And yeah, it's described that they were crossing into Westeros continuously over time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also intentionally vague. So yeah, it's. It's another reason why the hammer of the, that the, I, the, the story that the children brought the hammer of the waters down is doesn't really make sense because the humans were already here at the, if the children were to have caused the hammer of the waters at most, all they're doing is preventing more people from coming in. But by that point, there were so many first men here, the damage had already been done. Yeah, it's very silly. Um, and, and the world of ice and fire invites you to question it flat out. Cause they're like, well, why would they do that? And basically, why would they close the barn doors after all the horses escaped? Yeah. They, makes... Like, why would you break the arm of Dorne when the first men were already there to the point of causing you a problem? It doesn't make sense. It also doesn't make sense that the children of the forest would break the earth to save themselves. That's the opposite of their entire philosophy. So, yes, that one falls apart pretty easy. I love the hammer of the water stuff. And if you want the full deal on that, check out the stream called The Pact and the Hammer of the Waters, Timeline Heresies. That is one of my most popular live streams for world building. Lots of people like that one. So, uh, Tim, we've talked about um, the West, you know, the getting back to Westeros side of the, where do you want to go next, uh, Mr. Sherpa? What have we not talked about? Uh, well, we we haven't talked about Mossavi, and we haven't talked about the Grey Waste proper, and we haven't talked about Carcosa. Okay, well, let's, we mentioned Carcosa briefly, at least I tried to. What's yeah. significant about Carcosa? Obviously, it's a Lovecraft reference that you think could be uh, could have an implication for a Song of Ice and Fire. All right, so for me, it's the King in Yellow, and this is one of those ones that's uh, is a Lovecraft reference, but also not a Lovecraft reference because it's one that Lovecraft himself also pulled from another contemporary. Carcosa yeah. first appears in a short story. Uh, an inhabitant of a Carcosa by Ambrose Bierce. And then it's later. Oh, yeah, that's my ancestor, Ambrose Bierce. Oh, Bierce. Bierce, B I P R C E. Ah. Uh, my last name is Bierce, like glug, glug, glug. Um, sorry, but, go ahead. I just got yes. excited for a second. So, what, what you had in Lovecraft's time was he had like this sort of writer's club where they, uh, guys who would, would, bar would borrow from other writers that they respected and then the ones that were still alive like you had like a uh, there was the circle where they would exchange letters and ideas and there was a, a like a great hint of respect about that so guys would would uh adapt certain settings or certain characters into their own stories and carcosa is one of these ones that's kind of like football between one writer to another to another till it gets to lovecraft 
and then is incorporated into the Cthulhu mythos after Lovecraft's death. Uh, so it first appears in an inhabitant of Carcosa and then is later adapted by Robert W. Chambers in his uh, gothic fiction, The King in Yellow. And this is a collection of short stories um, and it's about a, a play about the central character, The King in Yellow, but to read the play is to cause madness. So there's never so never people so it's like a forbidden book you're not supposed to read it you're definitely not supposed to put a theatrical performance of it on and the king in yellow i love that by the way i, I think that's awesome <laughs> but to read the king in yellow uh invites the king in yellow it's it's like if you read the book you're kind of inviting the king in yellow from whatever plane of existence he is in into the world reading this book of madness is like is like uh, pushing the ether and allowing that door to open, and this is something that we kind of that we can kind of see in a song of ice and fire when we look at Euron, because Euron, for all intent, like the way I see it, is like Euron is trying to open that chaos door. Yeah, I was about to say I think he maybe read that book. <laughs> and there's a chance, and there's a but there's a chance that Euron, if he does succeed in this, he he's under the impression that he's gonna that because he wants to make himself a living god but there's also just as good of a chance given this whole lovecraftian thing how to look upon a lovecraftian god is to go mad that if you're on word to actually get what he wants and and open the chaos door as i see it he might just get steep immediately steamrolled by whatever is behind it behind it yeah i'm a big fan of this Euron gets body snatched by some sort of friggin entity theory i'm way into it <laughs> yeah it goes it, it and it goes back to like uh i couldn't say i made it i made an image for a stream that i i this is like i think i used a different cover so this is like a failed stream cover image mm -hmm. but uh let me let me show you what i did here i tried to evoke this idea i took urtak altanaz's euron dragon binder and i put the old ones in the background can you see that yeah so the, the old ones are watching from the sea as uh as euron holds up the dragon binder and gets ready to summon some dark magic so uh it was too dark and murky for a good screen cap tim the marketing department shot it down uh, <laughs> but i did have fun photoshopping this so i'm glad i can use it go ahead keep talking all right so this is something like I was I talked about in my solo stream last night. I gave my thoughts on Euron and what I what I really what I really think happened. Like, okay, let's say like first, I will give the benefit of a doubt that Euron sat outside of Valyria. I don't think he went in. I think he sent his uh his mutes in. I can see Euron just kind of like paddling outside in the smoking sea and just tell and just promising his mutes like, okay, you just go in there, go get me something, and whoever comes back alive will get their freedom. And then he sends like 10 guys in, one comes back, gives him something he found, and Euron just kills him anyway. That's the way I see it going down if if Euron actually got something out of Valyria like that that's the furthest though but him actually going to Valyria that that is the furthest I would get because I do not believe for a second that Euron has actually stepped foot onto like the actual Valyr Valyrian peninsula no nah, he's it, a chump he definitely no. sent some slaves to take the risk there's no doubt but I mean he had a slave he had a slave blow dragon binder so he's you yeah, know, he's yeah nobody's fool someone's someone's using doing his dirty work for him the gr and the grunt work for him and he gets caught, which is why I, lo I love Roderick the Reader as a character because of the fact that he calls Euron out on the on on his bullshit. But yeah, Euron Roderick the Reader is a great s side character. I really hope he does something cool. Mm -hmm. um, he should he should organize some anti Euron resistance. Uh, if there is a latecomer Theon Asha, you know, ruling the Iron Islands movement, I would expect Roderick the Reader to be a big ally for that. So. Well, what in George's Carcosa, like we I had talked about the sorcerer lord who's claiming to be a yellow emperor of ET, but we don't know how true that is because he could be a false claimant. 
we see that we already have a good false claimant in the story with Fagon, but Euron's also going to be another one who's going to be a false claimant because he wants to make himself king. He's already gotten himself king of the Iron Islands through the King's Moot, but his inevitable, his eventual goal, well, part of his goal on this on this road to li- being a living god is to be king of Westeros, and Euron. While he is an Iron Islander, and while he does, or at least in his youth, probably subscribe to the faith of the drowned god, as he's grown up and started having this rejection of gods, uh, but he st- he still uses the religion of the drowned god as a means to an end, and he still uses ironborn culture as a means to an end, even though he sees himself above it, and he's. We see, like in the Forsaken, Euron is gathering what's basically the worst of the worst among Ironborn among him. And while the Drowned God is a definite reference to Cthulhu, what I think you're, I actually could see Euron having more in common with another Lovecraftian being, which is Hastur. Now, Hastur uh, is a later is a later creation. It comes more from August Derleth after Lovecraft's death, and August Derleth is very contentious among Lovecraft fandom, to put it mildly. Because what Derleth did is he tried to create a pantheon with these Lovecraftic, Lovecraftian beings. Like, he tried to cre- give them uh, like a hierarchy. So he tried... He, he, and I'll give credit where credit is due. If it weren't for August Derleth, we probably wouldn't have a lot of the Lovecraft tales published that we do. But... I do. His mistake is in trying. To, he tried to make the unknowable knowable. But one thing he did with Hastur is he adapt. He made Hastur a half brother of Cthulhu. So Hastur, in his actual form, is also octopoid in nature, the same way Cthulhu is. And he also borrowed the King in Yellow. So Hastur in his earthly avatar appears as the King in yellow out of the Robert W. Chambers story. Now I think that you're on. Okay. So actually- hold, on, hold on. Stop. The King in yellow mm-hmm. is an incarnation of one of the old ones has store. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. So August Derleth, oh. August Derleth, uh, after Lovecraft's death, when he created, started making his own contributions to the mythos. Cause, uh, during Lovecraft's time, he only wrote one story that actually mentions Hastor. So Hastor as a character in the modern mythos comes more from Derleth and the and the later contributors after uh, Lovecraft's death. But Derleth modeled Hastor to be a brother to Cthulhu. And he and when and this is where we get the cult of the, the Brotherhood of the Yellow Sign. Uh, they're the ones that try to call Hastur to Earth. Uh, Hastur's avatar on Earth is the king in yellow. Kind of like uh, how another Lovecraftian being, Niar Lahotep, uh, he has many human forms, but one of them is as an Egyptian pharaoh. Um, ah, but I think- yes, right. Okay, I've, I've, I'm familiar with that idea. So, but thing- so that's what... So, okay, this is what... Sometimes I say things... Um, I take in a lot of information and because I have ADHD, sometimes it all just ends up swirling around in my head. Yeah. And then I sort of, and then I remember like years later and I, I try to say something, but I don't remember how I know it. I've been talking about with Quinn as well. Who's obviously a Lovecraft guy um, about this idea of you're on getting body snatched ever since I heard gray area talk about memory, sorrow and thorn, because there's somebody named in who's kind of like an Azor high Knights King, anti-hero villain figure from the past who's dead but his spirit's still out there and his whole thing is he's trying to reincarnate back into the physical world and he needs somebody's body to steal this led to my thinking about if there is a night king spirit out there or great other spirit dead azor high you know if the others are wanting a new knight's king that they might want john's body um so that they can fill it with this spirit and euron is the other candidate so i made this video called a new knight's king Mm-hmm. which is showing all the evidence that the others are looking for a Knight's King, um, a leader. And then I did a video, a couple of videos about Euron and John each exploring the possibility of how each one of them could end up. Like with John, it would be his body being stolen. Uh, with Euron, he's literally knocking on that door 
and there's a possibility that he either could be um, taken over by dead Azor Ahai, who I think is Night's King, a.k.a. the Great Other, um, and that that is how Euron could become a leader of the Others. Because Euron has all the symbolism of a Night's King, of a leader of the Others. It's really thick. Check out Euron, King of the Apocalypse, and uh, Night's King, Crow's Eye. But he is heavily implied as a leader of the Others, and I don't think it's just symbolism. So there's two possibilities, essentially, for how it could happen. One, he actually thinks he can command the others. Um, he tries, he goes north, he tries to take control of them, he's playing with ice magic somehow, something like that. Um, or maybe maybe he just thinks he can use the others as a weapon against Westeros by breaking the world and summoning the Bleeding Star, but he's not actually trying to use ice magic, something intentional. But I really think it's more likely what you're talking about. He's just trying to crack open magic power as much as he can and as hard as he can. And then boom, he becomes a doormat for some, some dead entity like dead Azor high. That's pretty much what we're talking about to take yeah. over his body. And at that point he's, he can then control the others or lead the others or, or do, you know, ride a dragon up North, anything like that. Yeah. Uh, and that's why, I it's, got a little excited there, I feel like. Yeah. And <laughs> it's 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 difficult because the Cthulhu mythos, because it is essentially a living, breathing text, because we still have authors to this day making their own contributions. And then it all and a lot of a lot of what a lot of this Lovecraft lore, it depends on who exactly you're citing. If you're citing Lovecraft himself, if you're citing Derelict, if you're citing a later writer, and then not to mention all the different video games and other and uh comics that have been made and it's like that's why i can see like george now george has had made commentary about his feelings towards fan fiction and to an extent i disagree but at the same time i can see like george wanting to kind of rein things in and have control over his have control over his own world because lovecraft as enjoyable as it is because of all the different writers, because there's been so many fingers in this pie, it kind of, be, after a while, it becomes a whole convoluted mess. And yeah, I, I can see, I can absolutely see both sides of that sort of uh, debate or conversation. Especially when it comes to Durlitz contributions, because you have some who, some people who like August Durlitz, other people say he was a hack who wrote Lovecraft's, love, who wrote his coattails. And right. I like me, like I said, I'm in the middle where I said, like, I can appreciate what he did in establishing Arkham and making sure that Lovecraft's stories got that the uh, stories that weren't published be uh, before his death, that they got published because that's the way we get a lot of these stories right. is on Durlitz's part. But at the same time, I said, I think his problem was in his method of writing was trying to create like a pantheon for Lovecraft beings. And that's like, no, you're taking something that's unknowable and you're trying to put it in a box so that it's easier to categorize. But right. And that's something George resists too. You know, he's, there are some rules and laws to his magic, but he tries to obscure them as much as possible. There's no mm -hmm. question. He wants it to be mysterious. He's of that school yeah. of thought. Uh, real quick to credit the artist, this is tentacles and teeth, the great old ones. Um, and the one I showed briefly, this is Messenger of the Old Ones by Brain Wronged. So just a little terrifying artwork there for you. Um, and let me also um, just shout out the artist that I used for my Euron videos, Michelle's Mini. Um, she did this, these two Euron ones that I love. captures the psychotic majesty of Euron, I feel like. So he's got the blood eye out in this one here. This is the cover I used for Night King's Crow's eye, Night's King Crow's Eye. And then this one is uh, is a pirate, a little more pirate looking. It's got the open, open pirate coat thing going on there. So Euron, King of the Apocalypse and Night's King Crow's Eye, two of my better videos. Yeah. Um, and uh, Skunk Works, what happens if he actually manages to get control? Well, it's going to be bad either way. Uh, you know, like if, if whatever's like if you're on, 
Euron's getting crazier <laughs> as he goes. Like the more evil magic that he's channeling through himself, it's burning away his humanity, just like Melisandre is transforming herself by using magic. So if Euron ascends all the way to demigod status or whatever it is he's shooting for, um, he's going to be pretty insane and evil and warped, and he already is anyway. So it's going to be really bad. And if Azor Ahai, the dead spirit of Azor Ahai turned Night's King, 8,000 years gone, is still lingering in the Weirwood Net, as many clues point to, um, and he gets control of Euron, well, that's going to be bad too. Um, that's going to be an angry undead dragon lord from 10,000 years ago who's back to cause a lot of trouble. Um, so either way, it's going to be bad. I do th definitely think Euron is the third head of the dragon. Definitely think he rides a dragon. Um, and uh, I definitely think it's going to be dark and awful when he does. It's going to be as bad as George can make it. And he's definitely going to continue to be the place where George channels the Lovecraftian terror into the story. That's what I will say. So going back with, well, let's get with Euron and Hastor. So, oh yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I just want to say thank you for adding to this great theory with the whole King in Yellow thing. I didn't realize that the King in Yellow was already a body snatched dude, and uh, and George put the King in Yellow in the story. So that's a major hint that he's playing with that storyline right there, yeah. isn't it? Because when we think the cult of Cthulhu uh, in the Lovecraft tales, the cultists of Cthulhu usually tend to be like sailors and a more rustic people. And that's perfect for the Iron Islanders. Hastur is, again, he's, he's a sibling of Cthulhu. So he's also an elder god and octopoid in nature. But his, his cult seems to be like more of the ref more refined and more high society, which is something that Euron is putting on and airs about him because of him being from House Greyjoy and from him proclaiming himself King of the Iron Islands, plus uh, his more than likely alias as Urothon Nightwalker over in Karth. The mm -hmm. fact that it's Zorozon Daxos who tells Danny um, Urothon the glass candles are burning, that means that you're, that must mean that Urothon Nightwalker has somehow ingratiated himself with the high nobility of Karth. For them to know, for them to know him by name, and to know that that's going on in, in, uh, in, whatever Carthine residence, like whatever I guess apartments that he probably holds while he's over there. Yeah, he's definitely got a scrying tower. And the thing about Hastur is, Hastur is in the other world. Like he kind of exists as a disembodied spirit sometimes that's looking for a host, and Hastur lives on the red star of Aldebaran and he can oh, be, shit. and he can be summoned to earth with a huge blood sacrifice. Well what's Euron doing? He's about to create a whole maelstrom of blood sacrifice in Old Town with the red comet flying in the background. I think so. Yeah the red comet um I've been I've been saying obviously my whole prediction about the new long night being caused by another moon meteor affair is going to require the red comet to come back. And I definitely think it's going to, um, mm -hmm. originally George had a five year gap. So it would have been eight years between comet appearances. And that would be very easy to explain, but comets honestly have very unstable and weird orbits. And some comets do return often and some return every 75 years. So the comet can do whatever George wants and when you throw in the idea that uh, magic might be able to summon comets, I'm looking at the dragon binder horn and the fact that the comets are dragons and thinking about the idea of comet binder. Check out my um, uh, who will blow, you know, uh, D Danny dragon binder video. That's what it's called. Um, the dragon binder could be an instrument for that. But even if it's not that, uh, just go back to the Azor High myth. Blood magic performed on this Anissa she screamed and the moon cracked open. So George is implying that blood magic performed on Earth might be able to reach into the heavens and make stuff happen. Um, so it could be the same red comet that comes back. There could be an Oort cloud out there that you can just call a comet from. It doesn't really matter. We're never going to know. Come here, girl. We're never going to know. But the point is, it does seem like calling a comet with magic is possible. Um, 
And like I said, I, the long night makes sense if it's something that someone does as opposed to something that just happens because it puts more agency in the hands of the people in the story. And Euron is, is the one. Um, so the fact that you're telling me <laughs> the yellow, the, the Hastor who body snatches the yellow emperor also lives on some sort of red star. Is that what you said? Well, Hastor in the, his, he does, he, his avatar, his earthly avatar is the, is the king in yellow. Okay. Uh, but it's, 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 it, it varies depending on which story and which writer you're taking, you're taking from. Yeah, that's okay. George is, would be borrowing from anything he found in, influential, so it's not about yeah. So canon in this and case. that's the th and that's the thing. Yeah. Like with a lot of this stuff, like it's not going to be a perfect one to one ratio. No, it's there, just just it's, places that George drew inspiration from. It's, exactly. It's, so yeah. so I'm not saying that Euron is a complete one to one ratio to Hastor or a complete one to one ratio to the King in Yellow, but he definitely has there's sim there's similarities. Uh, because because of this thing, because of this, because like the whole drown god aspect, Euron rejecting the drown god, but still being ironborn in the way that Hastor is an enemy of Cthulhu, but also still a sibling of him. And while uh, Euron has his personal sigil, like the the uh, the iron crown with the red eye being ha carried by the two crows, as a member of House Greyjoy, he also has the family sigil, which would be a yellow kraken on a black field. Uh, Has and Hastor, as being a great elder thing, would also be an octopoid like creature, a kraken like Cthulhu. Uh, and with the avatar of the king in yellow, so there's the great there, right? There's the great. So Joy that's why colors. it's a golden kraken. I think that's what George was. I think that's why George specifically made it the kraken is. gold. No, I can confirm it. I, I can, I can sense the truth here, Tim. Um, this is perfect. So here's the thing, okay. George just does, he doesn't just do hat tips. When he does a hat tip, he's referencing specific ideas that the other authors have used. So when he references Robert Jordan, um, how, you know, he does House Jordan of the Tour, and then he gives a different uh, Dornish house the sigil of the snake eating its own tail, which is the, the Ouroboros. That's the Wheel of Time, okay? The Wheel of Time series is based on cycles of repeating history, ancient people that are being reincarnated and, and actions that are repeating. So that's a fantasy trope, of course, and it's also a metaphysical concept from the real world. But that's the thing. George is not just saying, hey, I like Robert Jordan. He's saying, I'm using Robert Jordan's idea of, of repeating cycles and reincarnated heroes and repeating action. That's the Wheel of Time. So he references the Ouroboros and the Wheel of Time specifically. That's why I was saying, what is George trying to say by using Kadath and Carcosa? Well, the, this Yellow Emperor is a great example. Mm -hmm. the, yellow, the story of the Yellow Emperor is all about a human emperor who's an avatar for an old one, outer god, whatever, whatever. You know, there's various classifications, like you said, but some sort of incomprehensible <clears throat> and Lovecraftian deity, which means... It's not a physical thing. It exists in the void primarily and then sort of manifests into the physical plane in these grotesque forms and stuff. That's the whole deal with Cthulhu and the old, old ones and the great old ones and all that shit. Yeah. So and it's, and it's I'm also, almost done. Sorry, let me just finish my thing. Sorry. So basically by mentioning the yellow emperor in, in this out of the way place, he's asking you to think about the story of the yellow emperor. And so you pointing out the golden kraken thing, that makes perfect sense because that's where he's using the the parts of the actual guts of that story, right? Mm -hmm. And I was also going to say, and another thing he's doing with Euron and kind of, we can see with Hastor, with, as Hastor being an enemy of Cthulhu, but still being an elder thing, it's like a rejection. You can have a rejection of your, of your own culture, but you still are a part of that culture. Even though Euron's trying to, trying to put himself above the drowned god and put himself above all gods, we still see he still has to play into Ironborn culture, even if it is just a means of of getting to what he wants. It's still something that he can't fully escape from. Like he is, he is a great, he is a great joy. Yeah, good point. That's a very good point. And Euron essentially is drawing power from violating cultural norms, which is a trope you find 
Uh, and it's basically a way to set yourself above the laws of man. So he's pushing that as far as he can, but he ha still has to deal with his, you know, quarrelsome ironborn or whatever he calls them, ironborn yeah. children. So, and I do have this one, well, two quotes. One's from the king in yellow, actually spoken by the king in yellow. One's a year on quote. So the first one is by the king in yellow. And this is from the short story in the court of the dragon. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And then next is Euron Greyjoy. And this is him talking to his brother, Aaron the Damp Hair. Godless. Why, Aaron, I am the godliest man ever to raise sail. You serve one God, Damp Hair, but I have served 10,000. From Ib to Ashai, when men see my sails, they pray. Euron is trying to become this living God that the king in yellow is is proclaiming himself to be in the chamber story. Right. And then he takes the mask off, so to speak, the eye patch off um, in Aaron Dampere's yeah, and he shows the evening vision where you can see the dead gods. And he says, I am your new God, basically worship me, you know, and that's, what's going to make these chapters. So, but the, cause the other thing we got to think of Euron is it's going to be so hard to tell what's actually happening unless we get a Sam, a Sam POV from, from the Citadel. Our only POV to tell us is going to be the damp hair, and the damp hair is tripping balls right now on shade <laughs> of the evening. So well, we're so not gonna, we're not going to we're not going to know like when when I I can imagine when when the winter drops, what Aaron's describing that when Aaron's describing the things that Euron's doing, it's get we're going to be spending so much time picking through. Okay, what is actually happening? Yeah, what what is Euron really doing? And what's what's just uh, an illusion? And the question could be like some, but but since this is a world of magic, there's a very real possibility that some of the magic outlandish things that I can imagine the damp hair is going to describe, they could actually be what really is going on. But it's going to be such an unreliable narrator giving us this. That's a great point, and I, we stumbled upon that. A at some point in a previous stream, I don't remember where, but yeah, somebody pointed that out. Like we're we're not going to get a year on POV, so we won't really know if he's been body snatched. Somebody said, like, what if he's already been body snatched? And I was like, oh, yeah, fuck, we then we don't know. <laughs> um, I will point out that we, I do think, um, Sam could definitely have a scene with your. He, Sam's either going to escape with the help of Alaris the Sphinx, or he's going to be taken captive by Euron so that George can write interesting scenes, you know, and then maybe have Sam escape or something. I could definitely see that interaction happening. Then eventually Daenerys and Victarion will, their plot line when it comes back to Westeros will probably intersect with Euron. That's if Euron doesn't show up in Slaver's Bay somehow. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we'll, that'll be the real question is like, by the time Danny meets Euron, what kind of condition will he be in? And who will be in charge? <laughs> All right. Well, this has been a great stream, Tim. Uh, Anu thinks you're my best guest, and many oh, thank always you, thank you. get compliments when you come on, my friend. Um, and uh, he's pointing out that the Yellow Emperor is also a mythological figure in China, which is where all these people would have been starting with, as far as the inspiration. Oh, so, and that's I'm, that's that's where we got it from because. We jumped on this whole King in Yellow because of something, a bit of information we got from Yi Ti, this Yellow Emperor claimant who's in the city of Carcosa. So you can kind of, you can kind of see like how one one hand grabs the next hand, grabs it, it all, it, and it all links back and forth together. So it's it's Huang Di, Huang Di, and he is um, uh, the third of. China's mythological emperors, a cultural hero and patron saint of Taoism, he is called the Yellow Emperor. Um, supposedly born in 2704 BC. Wow. Okay. So this is very ancient, very old mythical history here. Um, his legendary reign is credited with the introduction of wooden houses, carts, bows, the bow and arrow, and writing. Okay. That's <laughs> pretty important. Huangdi himself is credited with defeating barbarians in a great battle somewhere in what is now Shangxi, uh, the victory winning him the leadership of tribes throughout the Huanghe Yellow River Plain. Uh, some traditions also credit him with the introduction of governmental 
institutions and the use of coined money, which would go along with writing. So he's, he's like the great king. He's the great civilizer. You know, um, Huang Di's wife was reputed to have discovered silk production and to have taught women how to breed silkworms and weave fabrics of silk. So uh, paragon of wisdom, his reign was a golden age. He's said to have dreamed of an ideal kingdom whose tranquil inhabitants lived in harmonious accord with natural law and possessed virtues remarkably like those espoused in Taoism. And I mangled the word remarkably for some reason. Sorry about that. <clears throat> On waking from his dream, Huang Di sought to in inculcate these virtues into his own kingdom to ensure order and prosperity among the inhabitants. So I'm guessing that's the thing that inspired these fantasy writers is a guy that dreamed of a kingdom then came back and tried to make it real. Cause isn't that something that sort of goes on in Lovecraft? Yep. At least dreaming of places and then trying to find them again. Yeah. That's Randolph Carter's whole deal, right? Yeah. Or, and uh, one of the short stories I read last night was a uh, uh, Stella face where the main character Kiranes is made the emperor because he he dreamt of the city and that, so he's dreamt of the city of Celeface, and so he was made the he was made the king. So there you go. Um, and that that's something that George can work with, obviously, because we have all these dreamers, green mm -hmm. seer kings, um, people like you're on taking a psychedelic shade of the evening, and and yeah, so very cool. Um, you've uh, you know, every time I say, okay, we're going to talk about a song of ice and fire and Lovecraft, you know, there's a temptation to be like, yeah, I've heard this before or whatever, but we, we've covered a lot of new ground today, Tim. Thank you so much for bringing all of this information. You truly are a Sherpa. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like I said, once, when I first started reading a song of ice and fire, when I saw these little East, when I saw these little things and I'm like, Hey, I know that name. Yeah, I know that name too. Like, what what are you doing, George? And then the more it took me actually learning more about George as a person to really get it. I'm like, oh, these aren't just him just ripping names. Like he's he's he like like I said like I said at the beginning of the stream, this is a man who's taking like just giving us just like one or two sentences, but creating entire worlds out of such little bits of information because you can then go. You, you go back and follow, go down the rabbit hole and go, well, where'd he lift that from? Then you take, read that story. And it's like, okay, I can kind of get an idea of what I think you're doing with this. Yeah. You know, he does that with Arthur Dane. We don't hear jack shit about Arthur Dane really, but the mm -hmm. fact that his name is Arthur and that he has a shining sword will automatically bringing in all the Arthurian legend and magic sword stuff. It's all sitting there in the background adding to the mystique of this guy who we've really only ever gotten a couple sentences about. So yes, this is very much Martin's skill as a writer. He's not just doing these as hat tips. He is pulling ideas from places and then giving you signposts back to where the ideas came from so that he can connect his stories with those stories in a kind of tapestry of literary tradition. And that's one of the things I try to circle back to every once in a while is this is what I think um, I don't, I could say the greatness of George R. R. Martin, but really it's, it's the greatness of the literary tradition. And it's a credit to a song of ice and fire that George is trying so hard to honor this tradition and to do his very best at continuing what I, what I call mythical writing, mythical storytelling, you know, packed with archetype and symbolism and very conscious of all the things that have come before and developing those ideas further. Um, I just, that's why I'm able to do a seven year running podcast about a song of ice and fire when no new books have come out in that whole time. And the show had an ending that kind of destroyed a lot of the enthusiasm in the fandom. And still we're here having these kind of informative streams. It's really a credit to George and how much knowledge that he packed into a song of ice and fire, which is basically yeah. like a time capsule from of storytelling because of, because of fantasy, sci-fi, real world history. And how we did, we had a whole hour where we're just talking about geology, you know, geology and plate tectonics. He can bring, he can bring some real world science into it. And we can have a whole discussion on that. Like it's, it's just amazing. Like how, how much you can take from just this little bit of information and create 
we've been going at it for over two hours on on places that we're never going to see in the books proper. <laughs> yeah, because again, they're not just obscure trivia. It's like he's mm -hmm. he's using these obscure places to get us to think about certain stories whose themes do matter and do have an impact on the books and do inform us about Euron, Azor High, and people who want to become gods. So there you go. I think that's probably a great place to stop. And let's, guys, if you have not subscribed to Gray Waste Tim's YouTube channel, it is super easy to find. You go into YouTube and you go to the search box and you type in, wait for it, Gray Waste Tim. Gray Waste Tim has very cleverly named his channel after the name that most people know him by. That's the smart <laughs> thing to do. Not everyone does that. Um, so yeah. there you go. Find and subscribe. It's a fledgling YouTube channel. He's only got a handful of subs. So go yeah. give him a sub. It means a lot when you're first starting out. It's really encouraging. He's reading some of the stories that, that we've just been talking about. Ambrose Bierce and uh, Robert Howard and Lovecraft and various other things. So yeah, check it out and uh, give him a subscription. And the link is, again, the link is an incomprehensible YouTube link. And the easiest way to find it, just search for Gray Waste Tim. It's gray with an E, Gray Waste Tim, and give him a sub because he's been such a good guest. Let's give him a round of applause, but more importantly, a subscription. Oh, thank you. Yes, um, if people like it, like I, I, I'd be very interested very very interested in doing more regular readings of like Lovecraft and other horror, horror stories, stuff that's in the public work. Now, I mean the public domain. Um, I also want to give a quick shout out to my good friend, Nick Eck at Nick Eck design, who um, along with doing some of the artwork that's, that's behind me is actually working on a sigil for me so that I could have like a proper YouTube icon and a proper banner and all of that stuff. So that's something I'm very excited to see. Uh, we have, we have designs. We've, he was here last night. We discussed designs that I'm looking very forward to see what he comes up with. And then, so guys, the cool thing about supporting a YouTube channel in its early days, you can have it, you could influence him. You could, you could hit up Tim on Twitter at the gray waste and give him suggestions about stories that you'd like to hear him read. And uh, maybe just maybe, you know, converse with the guy and you get your, get your request met. You know, I don't want to promise anything here for, for old Tim, but I know how it is when you're starting off, you're definitely like looking yeah. for people to engage and, let you know what they like and what you're doing and stuff. So, yeah, I'm hoping that the goal eventually is to take the essays that I've been kind of bubbling up because I'm and to turn them and eventually also along with readings to eventually turn those into proper videos or at the very least, or just continue being a guest on whoever will have me so I can keep spouting my tinfoil because apparently it seems people seem to seem to like it. Yeah, buddy, that's how it starts, man. That's how it starts. I definitely was a guest on a few places before I, you know, was doing my own thing. So there you go, guys. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, I will see you soon. Oh, let me just tell you what I'm doing um, this week. So you guys saw my channel intro video. Obviously, I made that. Uh, <clears throat> but guys, I started writing about ice spiders uh, two days ago. And I've written like 8,500 words of an ice spider essay video, which is about 45 to 50 minutes worth of video time. Um, so I've got a monster ice spiders uh, video coming. It's going to be awesome. I'm super excited about it. And uh, I just completely brainstormed it in like two days. So shout out to everyone on Twitter that helped and chipped in ideas. And that's it. I'm going to go run, celebrate the 49ers victory. Uh, and uh, probably get back to the script writing, get some food, all that stuff. So thanks a lot, guys. Make sure when the when this uh, stream is done, best way you can help me is clicking the refresh button so that you can leave a comment. Obviously, you've already clicked the like button. You've already subscribed to the channel by now. But when the stream is over, you can help it take off in the YouTube algorithm by simply refreshing the screen and leaving a comment. So thanks, guys, in advance. Can't wait to hear your thoughts. And I will definitely have Gray Waste Tim on again in the future. So, so long, friends. Bye, everybody. <laughs>